Okay. Uh, I think you have to stop sharing first. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Leon, and I'll be presenting this morning um, together with uh, Christian and Mike. And we'll give the introduction and tutorial to, to Salvis. And let me just quickly share my screen. Okay. Um, so once the cluster works, you will all be dropped into a Jupyter Notebook view that looks like this. But I'll explain this again once um, we actually manage to get this going. So this contains a, a couple of notebooks. And we'll start with the serial zero introduction one, just try to explain uh, that explains what we are doing. And please let me know if the font is too small, if you would like, like me to increase it a bit, if you can read everything, if I'm going too fast or too slow, uh, just let us know. And for those of you who have never um, seen these things, so what you see here is, um, do you actually see my mouse? Yes, yes. we do, Okay, if you move it. Okay, cool. So what you, what you see here are these so-called um, Jupyter Notebooks. These are basically an in-browser kind of interface to run various programming languages. And the nice thing about these is you can freely mix code and instructions and text. Excuse me, can, can, can you increase the size, please, of the book? Sure, of course. Uh, like this? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, the advantage of these things, of these Jupyter Notebooks, is that it can freely mix um, text and code and images and documentation together with what you're doing, which basically enables a very literal um, sense of programming and also teaching. And we'll use this throughout this tutorial. We will use it to interact with uh, Salvos and to look at, visualize various different things and run the whole tutorial in a set of Jupyter Notebooks. And what we will do today is we will perform um, a realistic continental scale full waveform inversion. And what it will demonstrate, it will, as it's basically written here, will um, teach all the required steps to carry out exactly this. And the important part here is we're doing a physically realistic viscoelastic full waveform version with um, our tool called Salvas Project. And what we'll do here, um, it's kind of important to note that we will focus um, on Central Europe just because it's a European workshop. But everything we kind of we teach today is ready to transfer to either other geographical domain or completely separate domains like medical imaging or non-destructive testing. Um, one thing to say about this tutorial is that in order to be able to run it in two or three hours, we need to keep the computational requirements fairly low because everyone basically has half a node. So it's actually also small enough to just run it on any laptop. And we achieve this via um, two things. Basically, we only use fairly long period or low frequency seismic waves, and we restrict the number of earthquakes or data we do. But it's also important to note that this, while this is a small problem, it's not a toy problem. Everything else is fully realistic and exactly what you would do for a full production scale, full waveform version, which you could, for example, publish in a journal or use to further some understanding of some region. We do use, we actually will download and acquire and use real, real data. We'll just query some um, data centers. We will simulate on meshes with realistic topography, use a realistic kind of objective function to compare observed and synthetics. And everything here can be changed and tuned and adapted to any to use if you see fit. Um, so if you want to read up a bit, um, you will also get access to these notebooks. There is a lot of different reading here. So we teach here, we cannot really teach the theoretical foundations of how full waveform version works. We'll try to hit the important key points um, while we're doing them. But if you are interested in how this actually works, there are a few recommended reading things here. There's a recent review article by Jürgen Trump from Princeton that kind of reviews the last 10 years of wavefield imaging of the Earth. There's a book by Andreas Fichtner. And also on our website, we have a fairly extensive knowledge base to try to, um, to, try to explain most of these things. Um, so what full waveform version, what you basically do is you try to recreate um, synthetic seismograms that match the real ones with the goal. Um, so basically try to re, re, um, you try to recover seismic velocities and densities into, in the earth by matching synthetic seismograms to the real ones. So you basically iteratively update, you start with some, some starting model, uh, you run some simulations and you compare the simulations to the observed data. And then you keep updating your velocity model until the synthetics that you compute through the updated model 
best match your data. And that's the general idea behind um, the full wave moon version. And it basically falls under the kind of umbrella terms of um, PDE constraint inversion pro inverse problems. Um, what we'll do in this tutorial is we'll use something called um, a Salvus project that is part of Salvus. And what it actually represents is the so-called high, it's the highest level interface we have to Salvus. And if you look at this pyramid, um, that's those the various, what we call levels or layers of, at which you could use Salvus. These all of course work and one builds on top of the other, but we'll be using the highest one. Um, and that being said, the base is that you would manually create your input files for, for the solver. Um, the input files in our case are TAML files, which are kind of a simplified version of YAML. Um, then you would manually create your meshes, which in our case are HD5 meshes. And then you would manually call the Salvus binary to take the input files, and use the meshes and produce some synthetics. And this also means you would have to interact with the queuing system and do all these things manually. And that's the base layer that of course works, that has to work. Um, and that pretty much also what I've been seeing in the last couple of days. And that's still a very valid way of way of working. On top of that, we have something we just call the simple config and solve this flow, which um, is a series of Python objects that map to the TAML files and the meshes. And it also does the, um, once you have these objects, it knows from, it can use these objects to create input files and meshes for solvers from these objects. And additionally, it contains um, a job submission framework. So what this means, it can interact with uh, remote machines via SSH. It understands various queuing systems. So it understands PBS, for example, like we'll be using today. It understands LSF um, or LFS, um, Slurm, a bunch of others, um, and just tries to handle this for you. And But what we will actually be using today is called Salvus Project, which uses all of these lower levels. And what this really tries to do, it tries to abstract away all the, all the technical things, it tries to enable you to focus on basically project at hand scientific um, things you want to want to learn. And also what you hopefully notice in the course of this tutorial, we, we actually do use Python to interact with it, but actually there's actually very little coding. So it's basically single function calls you do. And the way we did see this is that what you most, most commands are basically description, descriptions of what one wants to do. And of course, the advantage here is that for advanced use cases is of course still possible to script everything. Um, and what this results in is that you have, at the same time, you have a very highly automated way of doing things, but it's also highly flexible because you can tune and change every aspect of it. And what we hope to learn today, so it's going to learn and go, um, we of course fully realized that compressing down everything to two, three, four hours is not enough time to really grasp and understand everything. So that's, um, especially if it's the first time you're seeing it. Also, just because we have limited time and there are so many people, we don't have a lot of time for interactivity. So we cannot really do exercises to take too much time. But what we do hope to achieve today is that you kind of get a sense of how to use Salvos and whatever is included in to perform any kind of waveform simulation and inversion. You just get a generic feel of how the things work. And we also try to make clear in the course of the tutorial where you would have to deviate from our structure to tackle other problems. It might be a different geographical domain. It might be a completely different problem you want to solve. If you want to, for example, to solve um, waveform simulations on like some kind of pipe structure, we hopefully um, tell you where, where this would work. And while we do encourage you to follow along, and again, this will only work if the cluster comes back up, almost everything can also be learned by just watching us do it. So that should be fine. Um, and what we will do in this tutorial, it is split up in four parts. And we will basically go from, from really nothing. We will start with a one-dimensional starting model and keep updating this structural model. So we'll parameterize in terms of um, VP and VS. Actually, we will use a readily anisotropic model, but we'll try to create a model that better fits the observed data compared to the start, starting model. And this tutorial does include all the steps from setting up the domain and the, the problem to acquire data, do some limited QC, how to set up simulations, how to pick windows. Um, we'll talk about why you have to do this later. And of course, also the all important misfit computation and the der derivation of these so called action sources, as you might have seen yesterday in the Spectrum tutorial. And then we'll use these to compute gradients and finally feed this all into a nonlinear um, optimizer to actually run the 
optimization. Um, again, I mentioned this twice before. The whole point of this is that you don't have a structured, fixed, inflexible workflow. Should be should be able. Um, the, our goal was that this adjusts to anything you want to do, and can hopefully be modified to exactly suit whatever anyone wants to do. And uh, this includes everything: the data can be changed, the model, the way data is processed, the misfit functionals, um, regularization techniques, and the inverse problem. All these things can be done. And also all of all, well, not everything, but almost everything we teach today directly translates to full waveform version on any other domain, like for example, seismic exploration. And just in terms of the four parts we will do today, um, it's well said four parts, four separate notebooks. The first one, which we'll write after this one, um, deals with uh, setting up the geographical domain and acquiring data. Once this is done, the second part will go in, in depth of how to set up um, synthetic simulations to hopefully match that data. Then the third part kind of takes it from there and tries to select pieces in the synthetics and the observed data where they are similar enough to enable a meaningful comparison between both. And then how we actually define how we want to do this comparison via the misfit. And the last part is kind of the synthesis of all these things. It will use all these things to actually invert for, for Earth structure. Um, and now would, give, would be a good time to, if possible, um, does the cluster work now? Someone try? Not working, no. It's not working. Okay, no. um, not I'm important so far. I'll do the first one. I'll walk you through it. Um, when the cluster comes back online, you can just redo this. That, that goes pretty quickly in, in terms of running it. So once you're there, you're supposed to well, we'll do this again if the cluster comes up. You click here. And it will open the notebook, the first notebook for the setup and the data acquisition. And what you'll notice, um, most cells, they will, oh, sorry, most, um, all notebooks of ours, they will have um, a, a bunch of configuration kind of constants set at the beginning of each. And that's just for convenience. That's just to make sure you use the same settings in all the notebooks to make sure you, they are um, compatible with each other. And also, if you've never seen these types of things, that's a Jupyter notebook. In this case here, what you see here, that is um, just text, description. Everything that kind of has these um, angular brackets here, the square brackets, these are code cells. You can execute these by, for example, click pressing run, or also by pressing command enter or shift enter. And what you will see, as soon as it has run, you will see a number here. So this means this cell has executed as the first cell in this active notebook. And that's pretty important because um, you can, of course, then execute this, then this will import salvos and some other stuff at the second one. But you can, of course, also go back and execute them out of order. Um, please, for this tutorial, try to execute them top to bottom, because otherwise it might refer to something above. Um, just keep this in mind. Excuse me, one question. Sure. I think it's not possible to run Jupyter Notebook on the cluster. Uh, we are, well, if the cluster works, we, we set it up that it does work. Okay. We set up everything for you. Mm. We, we install, basically installed a version, we installed to, to the notebook the server there. Um, yeah, so if you've never seen Python, there's just variable def definitions. These are some things that basically import. So now we want to use this piece, the standard library, and we also want to use Salvos. But those are basically um, just details of how to use it. So the first thing we need to do when we want to simulate anything is basically choose the the domain, in this case, the spatial domain. And for full waveform versions, basically is the domain on Earth where you want to invert. And that's a pretty important choice because actually in, in full waveform version, um, this all sources and all receivers must be part of the domain. So that's kind of different from other types of inversions, but all source, all receivers must be in the domain you, you, want, uh, you want to simulate. That also means that if you actually want to use teleseismic events, you will have to go for the full globe. But we want to do, do this here. We will use uh, regional events. Uh, of course, that's also a bit of um, kind of chicken egg problem. In most cases, of course, if you want to run a full waveform version, you already know the region. You have a concrete problem to solve. You want to investigate some structure. And of course, you take it from there. But it would still be useful to um, have a look at seismicity and station maps. This will, um, I can just click here. This will open a tab with a big seismicity map where there is basically global seismicity from the last century. So you kind of get an idea where events and stations are located. So it can maybe tune your domain a bit. And it's really worthwhile to 
tune your domain a bit so that you have more source and receivers. Because full waveform version, not only in Sysmology, but everywhere is fundamentally limited by the available data. And we just don't have enough data. And if you have more, it's always better. The next thing is, um, now we're talk concretely talking about seismological full, full waveform versions, is to choose um, a suitable earthquake magnitude range to be able to figure out which earthquakes you can use. And there are basically two main limitations. You first have a limit on the minimum usable magnitude. And that is really only limited to what you can actually see. You, you need to be able to see um, data in the frequency range you care, and it must be observable across the whole domain. So if your domain is a few thousand kilometers, you of course cannot use a very small scale magnitude two or three event, you just don't see it across the whole domain because it, the signal drowns in the noise. So this tends to give a limit on the minimum magnitude for kind of continental scale studies. So one continent and regional seismograms, most studies tend to limit it to, let's say the, the smallest one to use is between four and five. Four is already pretty small if you talk about distances of a few thousand kilometers. And then there's also a limit on the maximum magnitude. And that is really that you, um, you need to be able for the classical full waveform version we're doing, any source is approximated by a point source. And so you can only use events that are small enough so that approximation still holds true. And that also limits it. That also depends on the domain, but in most cases, what people tend to choose is the maximum magnitude between six and 7.5 which if you compare this figure, you can read this, it kind of corresponds to a fault um, kind of rupture length of 10 to 100 kilometers, which if you're far enough, if, if you're far enough away and low frequency enough, you could still argue you can, you can approximate this as a point source. So that's the bottom and low, um, top and bottom the limitations of the magnitude. Um, for this tutorial, we will focus on a domain of uh, Central Europe, just because there's a European workshop. And that's just an image from the European Share Project, kind of, which tried to, um, I guess, determine the seismicity of Europe. And for the last hundred years, and you see there, while Europe, large parts of Europe, are of course, not that seismically active, then of course we have Italy and Greece, and the whole Anatolia fault system that produced a lot of earthquakes. And we also have the Mid-Oceanic Ridge there in the middle of the Atlantic. So there are quite a number of events, and also Europe is quite densely instrumented, so this makes it. Not the perfect use case for full waveform version, but a decent enough one. So there's many stations, many receivers. You can make it work. Um, let me quickly talk a bit about what we within Salvos or Salvos Project consider to be different domains. So the domain is just the physical representation of where you want to simulate and or invert. And within Project, we have um, several different domains. So we have um, domains in two or three dimensions. That's the first um, differentiator. So we have DIM2 and DIM3 for 2D and 3D. And for example, for a full globe, if you want to simulate some kind of planet, uh, in this case, that's Earth or Mars, you would use a so-called spheric globe domain, which is just a sphere of a variable radius with some other features. Um, there's also one we will use today. It's also DIM3. It's a spherical chunk. So this will actually be used today. You'll see this. That's actually why there's no picture. But that's just one certain chunk, one region of a planet. But of course, there are also others. There is, for example, this, if you care more about small scale regional problems and you don't, you can actually ignore the curvature of the earth. There is a UTM domain for UTM coordinates. And that's pretty good for, let's say you want to go down to the kind of spatial scale of 10 kilometers, then you can use the UTM domain, which kind of changes a few things. It changes the coordinate system. Um, it changes the source and receivers, because of course, they also have to be in this coordinate system. And then there are 2D, there are, for example, circular domains, if you have some two-dimensional global study, if you want to do this. And there are, of course, also box domains. And these can actually either be just boxes with an X, Y, or Z axis, or they can actually be, this would be also used for any kind of generic type of mesh or shape you have that doesn't fit into our predefined domains, you would use that. So for um, the U European project we'll do today, is we will describe it as a spherical chunk of the surface of the Earth. And so the first thing really is to define the spatial extent. And here, it's, now we actually see some bit of Python code. Uh, what we do here is the spherical, as you see here, that's, that's Salvos here, which is a domain, a three-dimensional domain, 
and a spherical chunk domain. And that is defined by having a center in latitude and longitude and an extent along both dimensions. And we define this here. That's actually pretty much exactly Stuttgart where the cluster is located. And we go 25 degrees from that point in both directions. We feed this in here. And of course, we also have to define the radius. This whole thing works for other planets as well. But if we are on Earth, it is, um, of course, 6,371 kilometers. And what you can also do, you can also, for these domains, plot them to see what happens. So if you execute the cell, well, which you right now cannot do, you see here, this is the domain defined. Here's the center. Um, you kind of might notice it's not, um, it's not a nice cube, but that's just because this representation uses a Mercator projection. It's just an, um, a consequence of the map projection that is used for these web-based views. If you view this in 3D, that's still a nice symmetrical chunk. Okay, um, that it's not exactly the same as this one, but it looks pretty much the same. That's just a very different projection. And this is always the case with map projections. But that, of course, we set this up. But in most cases, you would just kind of play around with these numbers until you have you put the domain right where you want it to be. So that's close enough. And we will now use this domain to create a, a new project. So the way this works is really quite simple. You initialize a project, sorry, here and from um, a domain object. So you say where you want to say, where on disk you want to store everything for this project and which domain you want to use. And this kind of construct just means if it, if it does not yet exist, make a new one. Otherwise just load an existing one from disk. Just kind of for convenience so that you can reload this. You can also execute this. And now at the P variable, we will have um, a valid project. Um, also, please interrupt me anytime if the cluster is uh, back up. Okay, um, the next part is to, to add data. Um, what we actually do here is for this thing, we will query, um, or we did query various data centers. Um, so, for example, the Orpheus. Orpheus is the European consortium of different data centers that have seismic stations you've got everywhere where you can just download the data, and also Iris, and there are many other ones. We did query this. But this can be fairly time, time consuming. So we ran this a few days ago, it took about 30 minutes for the thing we want to do here. Thus, of course, in the prepared um, tutorial, which you will use, the data has already been downloaded. Thus, many of the following cells will actually not do anything. But if you were to start fresh, these would actually we use exactly these cells to actually download the data. And what you also might notice, and here we are using a seismological project. So we kind of have the luxury of um, having data centers that have the, the data in well standardized formats. So you can just query the data and you can get information about earthquakes, about stations, about the waveforms, you can download all of that. And then Salvage Project does some internal mangling to convert these things to um, source and receiver objects that we can work with. If you would work on another domain or another problem where you do not have um, this kind of luxury and you need to define your own sources and receivers, you can of course do that. But then you would kind of choose one of the various source and receiver types Salvo supports and add to the project. We will not show this here because we're focusing on well, this particular example, but that's just how it would work. Um, there's some text here, but I'll just um, walk you through it, what actually happens. So the kind of first thing for a seismological problem, what you would do, you would add earthquakes to the project. So you would add sources you want to simulate and you want to invert for. Um, what we do here is kind of a prepared way of getting data out of the global CMT catalog. So that's a project um, nowadays spearheaded by Harvard, where I think they uh, they globally try to they try to have a globally complete moment tensor catalog up to, down to magnitude five. And the nice thing about this particular catalog is that it's, it's, it's extremely consistent. And the moment tensor versions are of pretty high quality and they tend to work especially well for kind of lower frequency full wave moment versions. So we'll use this as our earthquake data source. And then we just have this one command. Um, I guess I told before that this is Python, but there's not a lot of coding. And most of the things you will see, it's basically a single command that just kind of describes what's going on. So what we do want to do is we want to add, for like a seismological problem, we want to add events from an existing catalog. We want to add a certain number. We limit the magnitude range here. 
Um, we actually choose fairly big events here just because for the Satori we are so low frequent that we cannot use, use much, much smaller ones. Um, it's kind of also set the temporal, temporal range from which we want to choose events. And um, we also notice this actually will not do anything because we already as said before prepared this. So there's this kind of um, if clause here that if the product already has events doesn't doesn't do anything. So this will execute instantly. But otherwise, this will take a few seconds and parse the catalog and try to select some optimal subset of events. Once you have the events, you also need uh, the waveform data, um, and you can download this. But of course, you could also do you could also just do this before you could. Do it your own. You could assemble your own data set and then just point some project to use your existing data set. And this will work with most things, with most seismological data sets. So basically, anything the Python ops library can read and write, this will work within Service Project. But also, what we just do here, we do get into the same. If there's already data, we skip it and we already have all the data. If you wouldn't have this, you would call this download data for event function and that just takes some. Um, other parameters, for example, where you want to, which data providers you want to query, um, and also how much time before and after each event you actually want to download. Those are just some settings. Again, not a lot will happen here because that's already has all been done and prepared for us. For this, for a decent number of events, this can take this can take a few hours. So of course we won't, don't want to do this in the tutorial, but other side from that it will just work, and you will only have to do this once for a full inversion. You assemble your data set, and then you get going. Now we can um, visualize the domain again. So now I'm doing it in a slightly different way. Before I just called the domain object a plot, but now we have attached the domain to an existing project and we have added data to the project. So now we actually want to visualize the domain with all the data. And if we do this, it will um, show, hopefully, yeah, here, we'll show the same plot as before, but it will actually, and that's actually, I don't know what's this slower now, this will show, the same domain with all the um, sources and receivers. So what you see here in red, um, those are the sources and in black are all the receivers. So we see that's um, a fairly decent data set. That's our domain. We cover a decent chunk of our domain. If we would spend a bit more effort into completing the data set, uh, it's probably also possible to get data right here and maybe in Africa if we know where to find this. But that's for our purpose, that's a decent sized data set. It covers a domain. Things you always want to kind of look at is that you have um, events in various corners of the domains, and especially if many hopefully crossing way paths. So paths from the events to receivers. Uh, but you can see a kind of waves are going everywhere, which should enable a decent inversion. Then let's kind of get to the big elephant in the room, I guess. So one of the key aspects of why full waveform versions are, are hard it was just not your data is that the data quality is basically all over the place. So you're querying data from various different types of sensors from different agencies, different providers, um, different years, just wildly, wildly heterogeneous data. And of course, not everything is good. And so you need to do a bit of quality control. Um, one way, of course, is um, just doing this visually. So here you can if you do this kind of thing, it drops you, it kind of opens a waveform visualization widget. And we'll actually use this a few more times. Today, you can say like what you want to view. You want to view the observed data and which field, in this case, it's displacement. And we can then just select an event and have a look at how the waveforms for that look, if there is something. But of course, um, in a proper case, you would spend a bit of time and try to understand the data you have, try to look at the events, the sources, uh, sort of the events and all the waveforms and see if it looks reasonable. What I basically want to look for at this stage because nothing has been processed yet is that at least some of the events that do, con some of the waveforms do contain the event. So here you go, here there's nothing, then the event hits, that's the body wave and the surface wave train kind of comes in. So that's all good and fine. Um, uh, let's ignore this. That's just kind of a technical detail of how you refer to various pieces within Solvus project. So service project, um, in terms of waveform data, it distinguishes uh, three types of data. One is um, external data, which I've been using before. That is data that comes from somewhere else but Salvos itself. So it's basically non um, data that has not been simulated with Salvos. Then there's, of course, uh, synthetic data, which is data that has been computed by Salvos. And then there's a third one, which we dubbed process data, which are just any of these two with um, some processing applied to them. And we'll use a bit of this later, just so you have heard it before. 
And of course, um, if you have a look at this without any processing, it's completely infeasible to invert for any of this. You need to get rid of, especially the high frequencies because for comp um, computational reasons, we will limit ourselves to that part of the spectrum. And you will of course also have to correct for the instrument response and a bunch of other things. And the way this works in the service project is that you define a processing function and then use the processing function to convert the external data or the end data to process data. The important choice we will do right here is that we will filter the data to period band between 70, 70 and 120 seconds. That is a very long period, but that is a period band we will invert for today. But again, this if you would just change the numbers, you could use the same thing to do a higher period inversion. Um, there are a few more technical details here which you can read up on um, if you do this seriously. But what we do here is we you could define your own function here for the most common cases. We do have predefined processing functions. So there is one in um, project tools which says get remove response and band pass filter processing function. So what this does, it any data you feed into it, it gets this instrument response, removes the response of the instrument, so the actual physical units you can work with, and then it applies a band pass filter in the specified region. Uh, we just use this. We set the frequency range for this and the number of kind of corners we want to use. And we want to apply a zero phase or non-zero phase filter. Here we do want to, we don't want to have a zero phase filter. Uh, we do this and finally we just add this processing function to the project. And once you did this, and you just see basically p add project, and you add what we call so called configurations. Configurations kind of are various things in service project where you can tell it how you wanted to treat your data or how you wanted to simulate things. And you'll actually see a bunch of different configurations here. This is a processing configuration. In this case, actually specific to seismology because seismology does have the advantage of having well standardized kind of instrument response files. And just give it a name, you tell it what the data source is, which means what data it should use for the processing. And that is of course, the data we just added in one of the first cells. And then of course, you just add this function up here. And what will happen anytime you query process data, it will just apply this function on the fly and then give you the process data. You can have a look at this here. We again call the same um, waveform query widget. In this case, we will use process data and we give the same name as up here. And what this kind of syntax is, that's um, it's called a Python F string. It's a way to interpolate a string. So you can say, if you prefix a string with an F, you can just give any variable you have defined in curly brackets and it will just interpolate that variable into the string. It's just kind of a shortcut to get. And in the end, it will stay process data and the period bit name is uh, this thing up here. Okay, and then you can also see the field, and that is the, oh, I did not execute this here. And you will see this widget, now you see the data is much smoother. And if you change, change use some kind of other event and some kind of more reasonable stations, it's always, the good stations are always the, the ones with I, that's the GSN stations, it's a very high quality network. And then you see that is our process, displacement, wave, waveforms, and that looks like a beautiful event. Right, there's almost no noise in the um, body waves hit and then the surface waves come in. And they also come in all three components. Uh, looks very clean. That's definitely something we can, we can work with. And this would conclude um, the first notebook. Is, does, is the cluster up yet? We're just testing. I just got a note with GetNote, so you might try. Okay, so um, let's try this. It'll be a bit of an adventure. Okay, um, I'm going to open a website now which contains instructions of how you could, um, how you can get your own Jupyter notebook running on the cluster. Please don't all execute at the same time. We don't know what happens. So I guess the way I envisioned is doing this is you all go to this website here. It is um, mondaic.com slash docs slash misc slash cheese workshop. Uh, can you all see that? And I'll can you pass a URL in the chat? Yes. Chat, chat, chat. How do I access the chat when I'm presenting? Uh, just hover over the green area on the top of your screen. Yeah, there's no chat. Um, oh, here it is. Okay. 
Here. You all go here. And this contains instructions. Please don't execute it yet. I want to explain two things, what is actually going on here. Um, so if you all just click on, the, on this link in, in the chat, we'll go to this website. Um, one important thing is here, because we will um, launch a Jupyter Notebook for every user on the cluster, means that we must forward um, the ports to the, we must basically forward the, well, the server ports to your local machine, which means that every participant must use a different port number. That's very important. And the way we do this, that's actually an idea by Jose, so thanks for that is that we use your the last two digits of your username to your port number. Um, this is actually almost fully automatic except on Windows. So if you see in this box here, um, some commands, they will contain 33XXX. And that is the port number you should use. And 33 is just so it's decently high port. And the XXX are the last three digits of your username on the HLRS cluster. So if your username is, is this, please just use a 33. 765 for your port number. Okay, and there are two sets of instructions. Uh, please, if this doesn't work, let us know on, 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 on Slack or here. We try to spend let's maybe 15 minutes to get this working for everyone. On Linux, it's just a single command. You can just copy this thing. You can also click here. You will have to edit this thing with your username and then the rest will hopefully just work. On Windows, um, it will also be the same on the WSL. If you tend to use, if you will use PuTTY, it's a bit more work, but there are some pictures here that hopefully should get you set up. Um, yeah, maybe uh, take your first letter of your last name, see what, where it is in the alphabet and count that many seconds, and then try to execute this. And what this should do, so just to explain what it actually does, it opens a tunnel to your, uh, the login node, and then executes one command we prepared at the very end. And what this command will do, it will launch an interactive job, um, copy all the files you need to your directories, um, hopefully tell you when something goes wrong, uh, and also set up a tunnel from the compute node to the login node, so you can hopefully, it hopefully goes all to your same computer. That's why this command. Um, we actually do expect some issues for people, but let's just, um, just do this, and if it actually works for you, so what you will see is once. It doesn't work now. Um, let me share. I'm going to share my terminal here. I guess you all see my terminal now. Yes. Okay. Oops. So if you do this, that is the command. Maybe it's a bit small here. I'll make it a bit larger. Oh my god, the whole thing is bigger. Um, that is. The command I just copied from this. My username is, is this, and I just execute this. And if everything works, it will execute a bunch of things. You will see, it will check, do a few checks in the environment to make sure that your workspace is set up, it will copy the necessary data. Um, and now we'll hopefully launch interactive job. Oh, this worked, cool. Um, it looks a bit um, tumbled here because internally we are launching this thing in Tmux which has the advantage that your internet connection drops, you can just reconnect later. But if this works for you as it does for me, it will take about 30 seconds. And then it will launch your Jupyter Notebook server. And what you should see is a URL at the end. You would just take this URL and copy it into your browser and it should drop you into a Jupyter Notebook. It should basically show you um, the screen that can share here. It would should show you this thing here. Okay. And um, please, if this works for you, just press yes in the participants list in, in, in Zoom. Can if I add a comment? Some of you might have to add the um, location of the secret uh, SSH key uh, with minus I. Oh, yes. It's the same yes. command you've used done to uh, log onto the cluster. Yes, I can also paste this in the chat point. Yeah, so basically just um, here, just add it maybe right here, where you, where, where the secret, where you, where you use the secret key. And what this will do, it will give, it should give everyone an interactive PBS job for the next four hours. And we'll just use this to run everything. 
Also, if it doesn't work, no worries. You can follow along just fine by, by watching us because it would be nice if you, can, you guys can run it. And on Windows, there are a few more, more steps. We basically enter all the parameters here into PuTTY directly. So far, I see nine yeses and, and zero noes. Um, of course, if, if it doesn't work, just, just click no so we, we know that explicitly. And also, if your internet connection drops and you can't access it anymore, just launch the same command again. And it will only open the tunnel and nothing else to, to, to change. Okay, Fabian could share a command work, the links appears, but opening the link doesn't work. Okay, um, are you in Windows or, or Linux? Uh, using Linux but or Mac? Uh, it should be Linux. Okay. Um, so the command worked and the link appeared. This was totally fine. But when I copy it to my browser, it says, uh, or like open the link, it says unable to connect. Okay, might be some firewall issue, but I don't think so. Um, permission denied, yeah, and we'll use a large, uh, minus large I, not, not small I. Um, if you're unable to connect. Uh, can you can you tell us your your username? Maybe somebody else is using the same. Did you just mistype that? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, and I, I think for the private key, it's a, a small a, not a capital a small i, not a capital i. Oh, it is okay. Um, if you have the same, did you did you use your own username here? Yes. What might happen is that the port is already taken. What you could try. Um, Seems as I'm not the only one with a problem. Yeah. Um, okay, what do you, well, let me just show you something. It's a bit complicated, we can, we can try. Um, okay. Can you just go to a, to a new, open just a new shell and connect to the, I could only connect with SHI. Okay, I guess this works. Yes. Uh, just connect to the cluster. S sorry, could you please increase the size of the- file? Oh yeah, sure. And that's just for the people where, where it does not work. What I think might happen. Um, everything we did runs in a, in a Tmux kind of shell. So what you can type, you can type Tmux attach and this will show you the same thing as in the other one. Um, it's kind of small because it's still running the other one. But what you can do, you can, um, as a command, you can co um, press Control B. And now it gets confusing. It's the opening square brackets. And what you can uh, then do, you can scroll up. And what I basically wanted to look for is right so, at the sorry, top. Sorry, sorry. Uh, can you uh, move your window a little up? Because the last line we don't see. Ah, okay. The make also makes this differently. Um, Just a suggestion here. So I, I see 19 people have answered yes, and I know there's a, there's a couple of problems, but uh, we do have a couple of breakout rooms reserved for uh, for technical issues specifically for this case. Um, there's there's four tutorials that that will go through, and the second one is, is is pretty neat, I think, but it's relatively independent from the actual uh, full waveform work that we'll do in three and four. So uh, I think I would suggest that maybe the people with technical difficulties head to the breakout room with Leon yes. and I can give the second tutorial um, for the people that, that have it. And of course, this is all recorded um, if, if anyone wants to watch it later. Um, so we can see. That's good. Through. I'll stop sharing then and I'll go to the breakout room. Um, Jose, can you set up the, put me to a breakout room? So you want one breakout room? Uh, yeah, or maybe, yeah, I think one is fine. Or maybe okay. one for Windows, one for Linux? Um, yeah, Christian, are you around? Um, so in the past, you, uh, allowing participants to choose a breakout room didn't work. So I cannot, I would have to assign you automatically again. Okay. Just assign, me to the, be assign the people to me and I'll, I'll try to help them. Uh, can you assign me to a breakout room? Uh, okay, and yes. So I will do one breakout room. Please, yeah. everybody don't press the button to go into the breakout room until you really have to. So there will be the option to enter the breakout room or there will be the option to do this later. Please select later if you don't have a problem. 
And um, yeah, we'll, we'll get going here in, let's just say two minutes or so, um, just to get people who, uh, who need to leave the breakout room um, over there. Just for the people that, that haven't indicated either yes or no, um, it's totally fine to, to follow along. Um, if, you're, if you're not trying still, please also maybe select the yes so that we know that we are not waiting for someone and we can continue. Did I answer correctly? So you want to press yes, even if it didn't work, but it's okay to go on. Exactly. Okay. Um, if it didn't work and you want to have a solution, then uh, I guess Leon will try to help in the, in the breakout room. But um, with that being said, I'll, I'll start taking over the screen right now. Um, so here we go. Sorry, can I ask, do we have to run the O1 project setup? each of us, all of the cells, so that it runs for O2, or we can just do the O2? Um, you have to run the, the, the first one, um, um, at least to, to set up the project. And it, it runs through pretty quickly. Um, so I would just like go into it. Um, actually, it's a good try to see if it works, um, as Mike can do it with you. Um, you okay. don't have can you then give us a minute to do that? Sure. Can you, guys, uh, can you guys see my screen here? Everyone, everyone good? Yes. Good. Yeah. It's a little bit smaller the font. Maybe can you increase the font? Of course. How's that? Looking better. Okay, so yeah, as Christian said, we might as well just run through the, the previous notebook because this doesn't involve any heavy computations and we just want to make sure that, that this all works for you. So um, when you started up the Jupyter notebook, you should have seen a, a, a an image something like this. So um, what we're going to do now is go into zero one product project setup and data acquisition and just run this notebook from from front to back. So this is exactly what Leon showed you before. So there's really nothing new to see here. But when you open it, it should come up like this and you should see um, the, the material that Leon just presented. Now what we want to do is run everything all at once. We're not going to kind of wait and, and go through it again. So to do that, you can go up to the top, um, see this kind of kernel uh, menu bar right here. What I like to do is just say restart and run all. And what this will do is, now of course, confirm that that's actually what you want to do. And when you click the red button here, we should just get started and go ahead. Oh, hello. About the ending, the earthquakes, uh, can you hear me? Sure. Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, so you said, okay, we want a um, number of uh, 13 events, and you have uh, algorithm to optimize choose 30 events. So I just wonder every time it will choose the same events or it will randomly choose and 30 events? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, that, that gets into uh, the, the concept of how we actually optimally choose events for the waveform inversion itself. Um, in this tutorial, we'll pre-select a static set of events. Um, but for real data applications, if, uh, if you want to get a bit more fancy with the inverse method, you can absolutely randomly choose events and, uh, and, and help yourself out there. But for this tutorial, we will statically choose the ones that we've downloaded. Oh, okay. Um, uh, and sorry, it uh, presumably falls into the like, data collection, but in the function later on, you talk about removing the instrument response. Mm -hmm. um, is that simply just something that you, when you collect the data, you make sure it's attached to the yeah, streams so of data. Many, many of the um, seismological data providers, of course, provide this the instrument response information, and, and we want to flatten the spectrum. Um, and, and this is what happens here to make it more easily comparable with, with synthetic data that we'll compute. But essentially, yes, this is. In the back end here, we're, we're, we're just working with OpsPy. So if you're familiar with that, um, you know how the instrument response removal happens. Um, this, is, this is all done through OpsPy. Yeah, Can I get a I, general um, oh, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sure, could, could I get a general consensus on whether or not this, this notebook has run through for you? It, it should have been relatively quick and you should have seen the, uh, the images open up and, and stuff like this. 
Is this is this true? Oh yes, for me it run everything. Yeah. Same. Do... Yes. Um, in that case, then I would go up um, back to the home page here. You should still have this open in your browser. And now what's really important to do is just because we're working with a limited resource on the cluster is we wanna shut down this notebook before we continue to the next one. So to do that, you can see this 01 project setup and data acquisition and there's a little box right here. Click this guy and then this little shutdown icon should come up. Click that and the kernel should shut down and then we free the memory that, that we were using there. Now, if that's all been working fine, of course, I guess in general, just kind of pipe up if something doesn't work and um, I'll, I'll try and move forward at a, at a decent pace, assuming it is. Um, but now it's time to kind of go forward and actually start computing our first synthetic uh, set of synthetic data. Um, now I'm running this on, on my local machine and, and due to the issues we had with the, with the queuing system, we were a bit worried about updating the, the, the cluster version uh, at, at, at the last minute. So you'll see a few more pictures in the notebook I'm about to show, but the content and the cells are exactly the same. So what we want to do now is open up the second notebook, which is called Forward Simulations. Um, so everybody, um, just, just as we did with the 01 notebook, just click on that. And we should see a, uh, a new image, a new uh, uh, notebook pop up. But in your version, you will, you will be lacking this image. But uh, if for, for the pretty visuals, you can, you can follow my screen. The content is the same. So of course, as always, let me know if that, if that didn't launch. And um, if it did, I'll, I'll start going over a quick introduction of what we want to do here. So the first step in any full waveform inversion, of course, after we download the data and, and process it into a, a, a format that we're happy with, is to start computing synthetic seismograms uh, to actually match to this data. Now, in this notebook, we're going to basically do everything required to do that on the European domain that we've, uh, that we've already initialized. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk about adding you know, generic 3D models to our, to our, to our project, uh, topography, bathymetry, and different types of physics that really help, um, help, help these things uh, uh, compute accurate seismograms. Now, as Leon said before, um, just a quick mention. So in this case, we shouldn't restart and run all um, because we will go through these cells one by one. So if you did do that, that's fine. Um, it, it will just run through the notebook. But the, 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 the best way to do it would be to kind of click through cells one by one. You can either highlight them and click run and it'll move through to the next one. Or on, on most keyboards, you can click shift enter and it'll actually execute the notebook. Um, and also keep in mind that there's the, you should execute all the cells. If you miss one, you might be missing some data in your Python process. And uh, if you get an error message, just, just let us know. So as you see here, I executed the first cell and I can see the one there. So I know that it actually executed. And as Leon explained before, these are basically some global settings that we'll be using um, per notebook that just you know, set up the state, the general state of our project. So what we're gonna do first is reload the project that Leon initialized in the previous notebook and now that you have as well. So to do that, first, of course, we need to import the Salvus tools into the current notebook. And that's done with this command right here. And then we're gonna go through and instead of creating a new project from domain, as we did previously, we're just gonna open the project that was already on bit. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, kind of the purpose here is that you can run some simulations, process some data, um, but not have you know, one monolithic Python script or monolithic notebook that basically keeps running and keeps track of the state all the time. The idea here is that you can you know, do some work in some day, save the state to your project directory, come in tomorrow and open it up again and check how your actual simulations or inversions are running. Um, what what's also makes me is kind of sharing data with, with, with colleagues because you know, the project uh, on, on disk has a very specific file structure and directory structure that is recognized by, by other versions of Solidus. So you can kind of ship stuff around and, and, and see, uh, see what other people think of, of, of your work and your data. But with that being said, it's, it's time to get started on, on actually running some simulations. So we wanna do something a bit non-trivial here. We wanna make a relatively complicated 3D model 
um, and, and run a forward simulation through here for a European domain. So in Salvus, we kind of distinguish between three different types of models at the, at the moment. We have material models, which is kind of the familiar VPV, VPH, um, and, and, and seismic velocities and density. But we also, of course, have models of topography and, and bathymetry, which, which affect the, the surface and the, um, the ocean uh, characteristics of, of the actual mesh and wave propagation. So we'll go through these one by one below. As a material model, um, we've selected uh, S362ANI. So this is a kind of global 3D mantle model of, of, of shear wave, anisotropic shear wave velocity. And you can actually download this directly from the Irish Earth Model Catalog. Now we've done this already. So it's, it's already placed in the data subdirectory, but the file we downloaded is the exact same file that you can download yourself uh, from the EMC. And kind of to expand on this, um, any model which is at the EMC, which is consistent with the NetCDF file conventions stated, can just be used directly in Salvus um, on, on both the global and, and local scale. Um, just from experience, we found that not all the models there do actually conform strictly to the conventions. Um, but uh, of course, this is a good motivation to, to ensure that they do. So we're going to take S, S362 Annie, which we downloaded directly from the website. Um, and we're going to read two specific parameters from there, VSV and VSH. There are a few other parameters in there, but, but those don't fit with our current model discretization. So we're only going to focus on VSV and VSH for now. So we did this, and we added the parameters, uh, th this model, to the project. And what this did was essentially take that NetCDF file, bring it into our directory structure, and set up the kind of internal representation of a model that, that Salvos can work with. Now here we're, you notice that we're using something called a generic model. And this is a bit unrealistic given the character of S362 Annie, which is only a mantle model. This is one of the few times you'll, you'll hear in this tutorial that we kind of scale things down because we're all running on, on, a, on a cluster with, with limited resources. Um, but in general, what we, would, what we would like to do is basically set up uh, individual models for specific domains. I mean, a mantle model and a different cluster model. And you can do this by basically changing which type of model you add generic model, mantle model, or crustal model. And then these will be mixed on later and when we actually start our simulation and set up the mesh. At the end of the tutorial, I'll show an actual example of, of what this looks like for a more complicated use case. But for now, just know that we're basically flooding the entire domain with a mantle model and we're not restricting that to the mantle. This is unrealistic, but again, um, this is due to computational concerns. Okay, so next up is topography. Now, we, we know that, especially at higher frequencies, topography can have a significant effect on, on how waves propagate and, and the data that we record. Um, and, and we, of course, want to be as accurate as possible. Now, the actual inclusion of topography in, in general cases is not so trivial because you, um, you quickly run into problems of actually aliasing or basically oversampling topography or undersampling it, depending on the actual resolution of your mesh itself. So this is a bit of a difficult problem. So on our website, we basically, uh, we, we host pre-processed data files, which integrate data from EGM 2018, Earth 2014, and CRUST 1.0. If you follow this website, you can see all the, all the proper references there. And this allows us to basically automatically select at mesh generation time, the optimal uh, um, representation of topography for a given mesh. And in this case, this allows us to go to basically 1.8 kilometers uh, topography resolution glo globally. Um, and you can kind of see an example of how this optimal um, uh, um, anti-aliasing happens in, in the images below. Now, we won't go into this today, but of course, it's sometimes interesting to, to look at really short scale topography. Um, and to do this, we do support uh, UTM domains, which is basically works with the GMRS web service and can download topography and data uh, up to, uh, I think, 80 meters resolution in, in some areas of the globe. But for now, we're working with global topography, so we'll use the pre-processed data sets um, as below. Again, you can download these from the web, but we've done this for you, so we don't kind of um, thrash the web server. And just like the uh, um, material model, we add this to the project um, with the following command. Now, finally, not to belabor the point, but um, there's one more type of model we're interested in here, and that's bathymetry. So um, we know that out of all the kind of additional physics that affect seismic waves on the global to regional scale, the effect of oceans is, is, can be very significant, especially at higher frequencies. 
And when you get to very high frequencies, you really start needing to actually model the ocean itself as a separate fluid layer and couple this to the subsurface. In our case though, again, for computational considerations, we'll treat the, um, the oceans as a basically a loading term on the surface of the mesh um, and not actually put fluid elements there, but just put a load. Um, the format of this model is the same as, as we've downloaded before and we added to the project in the same way. Okay, so if, of course, let, let me know if, if something went wrong. But at this, at this stage, um, we basically now have everything to, that we want um, to go ahead and actually set up and run our first simulation. Now, this cell is a bit long and, and it is because the next cell is probably the most complicated cell that we'll see. Um, this is in the end kind of a bit of necessity because to actually finally specify exactly the quantity you wanna simulate, there just are a certain level of, of, of detail that you need to provide. So I'll quickly go through exactly the, the, the parameters that we're, that we're um, gonna specify here. But of course you can go through this at your leisure and, and ask questions later in the Q&A if you have any specific questions. But essentially we want some parameters which define the resolution of our simulation and the accuracy of it, the period band which we wanna, which we wanna um, simulate. And then of course we get into what we just worked on. Now this is where we start talking about adding the different models to our, a concrete simulation that we'll, that we'll produce. And this here, the terminology changes a bit. We've gone from a model, a, a material model, a topography model and a bathymetry model to a configuration of those same terms. And what we mean by this is basically the combination of different material models or topography models that come together to create one single simulation. So for instance, um, if we had both a mantle model and a crustal model, we would pass these both to a model configuration um, to, to create the final model that we want to interpolate. Now, next you'll see when we go down that we have an event configuration set up. Um, so what this basically allows us to do is, 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 a, is add time dependent information to our simulation. The actual the source time functions that we'll use in which we specify here can either be specified by you manually or as we'll see in later stages, will, can be optimally specified in a, in a way that respects the processing of the data that we've done. Here we'll keep things simple and basically just put in an analytic source time function. Uh, you see Ricker there, that's actually a typo and it should be a, a Gaussian in, in half durate in, in moment rate, but um, it is what it is. And of course, here we also basically specify, you know, how long we want to simulate for and perhaps any additional flags that, that we want to work with. And then finally, we need to specify our boundary conditions. Um, Salvus works with a kind of damping layer type boundary, which is, which is stable in, in essentially all uh, sim situations. But of course, this does require additional elements um, which, which pad the domain. Uh, since we want to keep things as cheap as possible, we're just going to um, add a simple boundary condition of the Clayton Enquist type in, in first order. Um, and, uh, and, and we do this below by basically saying the buffer size is zero. So here basically lies the, the complete complexity of, of specifying a simulation. We have our kind of resolution criterion. We have our models that we specified up above, which we either downloaded from Iris or, or provided ourselves. We kind of have which, how we want to model our events. We're going to use a, a Gaussian in, in moment rate. And we say, you know, we want to simulate for X number of seconds. And this was specified at the top. Finally, we add absorbing boundaries. And now we're basically good to go. Did I run that cell? No. OK, so that's kind of a lot of detail. But now we can kind of see what this does for us. So when you run this next cell, a whole bunch of stuff should happen. You should see the interpolating model command come up and you should see a whole bunch of kind of um, uh, progress bars as you see up here. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But when this finishes, and it should be pretty quick, um, and depending on how fast your internet connection is, uh, you should see a model pop up like this. It is a general consensus on whether uh, yeah, people are here. Somebody. I can hear you, yes. Okay. 
Yeah. It's coming okay. up. Yes, cool. So let's take a look at this quickly. What you're seeing here is the actual mesh that we'll use in the simulation. On it are, are placed the sources and receivers kind of that, that we specified before, which we saw on the map view, and which are now specified in the actual simulation view. And you have a, you have a few options here on how to kind of look at this in a, in a bit more detail. What I first want to do is go down to the parameter field here and click VSV or VSH, you choose. Now remember, this was the 3D model that we, that we specified from S362 Annie with the caveat that it's a bit unrealistic to also put that in the crust. That being said, you can see that the model was interpolated well. Um, and then basically this kind of, this kind of plug, and, plug and play or so behavior extends to other models from the EMC or, or that you provide yourself. And the same would be true for, 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 for VSH. Um, something else interesting to look at is the actual ocean load, which we uh, specified it with, the, with the bathymetry parameter above. And so what you're looking at here is essentially a measure of the, of the ocean loading height at each grid point. So this will be a weight boundary condition placed on the surface to kind of well approximate the, the effect of the oceans on the, the long frequency waves that they were actually using. Now this is a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool widget and it really helps kind of doing QC in the initial simulation setup. You wanna make sure that uh, you know, not, nothing crazy is going on. You, your model looks as you expect. Um, and this is a kind of a, a nice and easy way to do it. Now, just a quick comment, you, you probably saw all these, uh, these, these progress bars coming up with the text locating and items. What does this actually mean? Well, what, what, what's happening here is that actually exactly placing sources and receivers at a certain depth is, is not really a, a trivial task as soon as the mesh becomes deformed as it is here because of topography. So to deal with this, um, basically before the simulation is run, an auxiliary optimization problem was solved to ensure that the source and receiver locations are exact with respect to the mesh surface. So what this means is that, you know, if your event happens at 20 kilometers depth, that will be then, then placed 20 kilometers below the surface of the mesh, which in our approximation represents the surface of the earth. If we did not do this, we'd have to know the kind of absolute location in um, our, a global coordinate frame of the event um, beforehand, which of course we, we just don't know. So this is uh, kind of happens behind the scenes to help you out. Okay, so now we're kind of get into, get into the whole point here. Now we wanna actually launch the simulation. So we're gonna uh, leverage Salvas Flow, which I talked about on, on, on Wednesday to manage job submission and monitoring for it. Um, so we will be running this simulation locally. Actually, I'm running this on a, on a GPU that, that I have. Um, and uh, of course you'll be running it on the training cluster. Um, but if you go ahead and get this thing launched, um, let's just do that and, uh, and, and let that run while, while I keep talking. So what did I do here? Um, I selected a single event um, as from the 11 that Leon downloaded previously. And I basically chose as a simulation configuration or simulation settings, my first simulation, which we set up above. The site name, um, this was specified at the top. For you guys, it's the cluster. For me, it's my local machine. And the ranks per job is also something specified at the top. For, you, for me, it's one. For you, it's eight. And there's an extra kind of argument that we're adding here. And this is because the whole purpose of kind of the end result of this tutorial is to download a movie of the wave field um, in our target domain. And so what we're here saying to Salvus is, is, you know, at the surface of the Earth, uh, the side set R1, that's the, that's the top. Um, every 100 time steps, outload the uh, write the entire velocity field to disk. And uh, we'll open this in pair of you in a minute. So if this launching happened correctly, we can go down and actually query the jobs below. Now, mine will be finished um, because my uh, uh, simulation ran on, locally on a, on a single GPU, but uh, yours might be probably still running. Um, it, it takes quite a bit longer on the, on, the, on the cluster as we're only using eight nodes and the, the processor is, I believe, nine or 10 years old. Um, it would be good to have a general sense of, the, of where you are, Christian, if you're running it, maybe uh, that would be good. Sorry, Mike, say it again. Just in terms of, I know that, that, the, the, that the status will be different depending on which machine you're running on. 
I'd just like to get a sense for, you know, how far along people are, if it's still running, if it's halfway done, um, if it didn't run at all, stuff like this. For me, it's still running. It says submit a job. Did you click on query down here? Because that you won't get an status update until you click the query cell. Um, no, not yet. Oh, I have the same output as you. Does it mean it's finished? Uh, yes. So this should oh. mean it's finished. And for me, it's also finished. I also have no yeah. matching simulations found, and it's true. Same. I have no matching simulations found, but I don't see any output. Yeah. Should have taken about, I think we, it's like 100 seconds or so from, from job submission time. Um, depending exactly on the on the on the number of things going. All right, but so I was I was kind of planning on on going over this while that was running. But essentially, what happened here? So um, the p.simulations.launch command um, was a command from Salvus project that essentially checked the input file that we specified as a simulation configuration. It generated our mesh on the fly for us, interpolated the model attached all our sources and receivers via the optimization algorithm. Um, if you were running locally, it would have started the simulation locally. If you're running on the HPC, um, it would have communicated with the HPC and got everything submitted. Where everything's running with Salvus Compute on the NVIDIA, on the CUDA and C++ backend. And then finally, query kind of says, um, you know, where are we and, uh, and how are things working? Bit? I'm a bit confused on why no simulations were found. Well, I guess because the job was running so fast on your machine that it was already finished. So the widget only updates until the data has been downloaded. As soon as you download the data to your local machine yeah. uh, and you query again, then it basically says uh, there's nothing in there anymore. Yeah, I guess we should have quick click query a bit faster to see the widget. Oh, well. Um, OK. so. If you run these next, so the purpose of this was basically just to, to show what's involved in setting up a, a 3D simulation uh, for the global on the regional to global scale with Salvus. Um, so just, just kind of recap of what we did. We specified a fully anisotropic or a radially anisotropic model. We added bathymetry, topography, and um, a, uh, selected a source and basically ran um, through like an abstract machine getting everything done. Now, in future tutorials, Christian and Leon will take you through actually comparing this with real data and doing the inversion. But what I want to end with is um, basically a, a quick demonstration of, of kind of the visualization that you can see from a uh, from from a project. So, excuse me, sorry to interrupt. Can you increase the font size or zoom in to this? Sure. Yes. I think this is probably as big as I could go. So. Well, it's nice to kind of stay within the project framework and, and use it to analyze data. It's, it's very convenient. It's sometimes nice to also basically break out of it and analyze the data you know, in your own scripts and, and however you, you want. So to basically do that, there's a little API function that says get simulation output directory, which will basically tell you where all the data has been downloaded to. So here we're saying, you know, let's use my first simulation, which we created above. For this event, give me the path where it's saved. Now, Keep in mind that this will not be the same as yours, because of course this will be on the remote machine. This is of course my home directory on a computer in North America. Um, but with that being said, you should be able to basically copy this path and rsync it locally. So let me just switch my screen to uh, to the actual desktop. I guess you guys can. Can you guys see my terminal up here? No, I uh, know just a new Jupyter notebook. Just the, oh wait, I have to actually. How about now? Uh, now we see your beautiful desktop uh, background. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm sharing the other screen. Do you see a terminal there now? Yes. 
Okay, great. So, so what I did, let me just make this bigger, is I just copied the command from the notebook, which you can see, or I copied the path from the notebook. And now I'm going to just rsync it, that directory, to my local computer. Now, at this point, you'll have to type in your um, the address of the cluster, the HLRS training cluster. My computer is called Domino after a friend's cat. So I will use that instead. Oops, copied the wrong command. But you should be able to download the uh, download your data as well. Let me know if this is if something's going wrong for you. In there, you'll see there's a receivers file. This is an ASDF file, so this is natively openable with, with OpsPy. You'll see you know job information, STD air, STD out, um, and, and other stuff. But what we're really interested in right now is this surface data output and surface data output Elastic Surface XDMF file. So I downloaded those to the directory called output three. Um, where I can actually see those files. Now, what I'm going to do is, is open Paraview. So if you downloaded Paraview um, from the website before the tutorial, and if you used it, feel free to follow along. Um, feel free to do it yourself. If not, just feel free to, to follow along. Oh, sorry. Can you copy then the command that you downloaded the data to the chat? Sure. Of course, keep in mind that you'll have to use, uh, use your own. Um, let me modify a bit before I paste in the chat. Where is the chat? There we go. So just make sure to replace the, um, the, the addresses with your own. You can also just follow along here. So this will be pretty quick. Can you see Paraview now in the, in the screen? Yes. So basically, I just want to open up. So I put it to my desktop, output three, the surface data, uh, elastic surface.xdmf file. This is important. So the HDF5 file is where all the data is stored, but the XDMF file is what Paraview knows how to read. It basically points to the HDF5 file. So don't open this, open this one, the one with the XDMF suffix. We click OK, and then here's the second important thing. Paraview sometimes is a bit funny with how it interprets data, and the actual XDMF format is, is not totally stable over all readers. So what you want to do is select the XDMF reader not the XDMF3 reader. The XDMF3 reader might result in a crash. If you don't see the, the normal XDMF reader, it's possible that you downloaded Paraview from um, the Linux package man management system. And kind of the default version there doesn't include the XDMF reader. So you have to download it from the website. So I'm going to click OK. This basically loads this into Paraview, click Apply. And then I see you know, a funny looking curved thing. What is this? I can go up here and click velocity. And I see a, a little something there. I can click play. Of course, readjust the color scale and see the wave field that we just computed. And kind of go back and forth and, and, and uh, do whatever you want here. So of course, this is kind of the starting point for you know, much more interesting explorations of how waves are actually propagating through 3D models. And at higher frequencies, you get a lot more excitement. And eventually, the workflow from, from scratch to a 3D model and to forward simulations. Just to quickly mention, I said that I kind of show a more complicated use case. So 
if you really want to scale this up and do something interesting, of course, you can look at uh, places where there, where there are really detailed models of the subsurface, for instance, um, North America here in, in a different use case. You can see here, we kind of have a restricted crustal and a restricted mantle model here, uh, following the concepts that I introduced above. Um, but in general, this is scalable to different areas of, of the earth. And also, as we said before, to, to UTM size domains, if you really want to work on a couple hundred kilometer scale. But um, that's all the time I'll take to right now for the forward simulations. Um, I hope that that, that went well for, for most of you. And I would pass it back over to Leon, um, who will now continue with um, uh, uh, running the actual inversion itself and uh, and moving forward with with getting some updates like maybe just for um for the ones that that have joined uh, from the breakout room do you can you maybe summarize in like three four minutes um what happened in the notebook um so can people get a get a feeling what they will need i think in the later notebook will, will be the topography file and the bathymetry file they need to be added to the project aha uh -huh, true good point so uh, did, actually, um, how did that go? Is, is, are most people here now that had issues before? The, the breakout room is empty. Uh, I think there are still some, some jobs hanging. So, uh, sorry, as, so as Christian mentioned, I'll just I'll quickly go over what we did. I'll make this a bit smaller so we can just see a bit more. So uh, what we did was basically kind of go through over all the steps to, to get things set up. And if you're just joining, I would recommend, as, as Christian said, to actually run at least a few of these cells to get the project into the correct state so that it will work uh, properly for the, for the further tutorials. Um, as we saw, the simulations go relatively quickly. So you may be able to just do kernel restart and run all, and maybe wait about, probably, I guess, three or four minutes for the whole thing to go. Um, but if you don't want to wait that long, what's really important is to basically just execute cells uh, one through six, essentially. So finishing with the ocean bathymetry cell here. And just an overview of what this does is that we've prepared a few data sets on, on disk for you, um, which were essentially just downloaded from the internet, but we didn't want to, to risk the bandwidth there. Um, and, and what these cells do is basically take those data sets and copy them into the Salvas project structure that, that Leon introduced before. Uh, sorry, Michael, I still see only the power of you. Oh yeah, of course. Sorry. That. Uh, thank you for that. All right. Now you should be back. Uh, yes. Okay. So yeah, that obviously didn't make much sense if uh, if you weren't if you weren't seeing uh, what I was looking at. But for those of you who just joined, I would recommend at least running Notebook 2 forward simulations for the first six cells. So basically, until you've completed the add to the project of the bathymetry data here. And the reason that we want to do this is because it basically just sets up the project um, for, for the state that, that Christian and Leon will, will continue on later. Um, in general, we, we kept going here and, and, and set up a simulation and, and ran this and looked at the output. Um, but the kind of important parts to get going are, the, are those first six cells. That being said, feel free to just run the whole thing and then expect a, a few minutes wait while the whole thing completes. Uh, Mike, can I interrupt a second? I have the impression that the note sharing doesn't work. So apparently there's many people still in the queue. So maybe I can suggest that the instructors um, that have been running this uh, interrupt their jobs and uh, free notes for real participants. Yeah. I do have one running. Hopefully that gave somebody, uh, somebody a slot. Um, and of course, if, yeah, if there's any questions now, feel free to ask, but we do also have a, a Q and A this afternoon for, for two hours, so. Um, that that could be a more appropriate time as we should we should continue with the tutorial. Okay, um, as my as the final thing I'll do then uh, you can yeah you can see my screen. So remember we want to close the notebooks when we're done. So I would just go back to the home page here that you should see in, in your browser. Now we're done with forward simulations. Remember to click this little box here and click shut down. And that should again free up the, uh, the memory that, that it was using.
just so we don't overload the system with too many notebooks running at one. And with that, um, I think Leon, um, you should uh, you should take over. Yes. Um, you have to stop sharing first. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, also, maybe we can, um, if it doesn't work for somebody and they really want to do it, um, as long as the cluster is online, this will still just work. Maybe we can also try this afternoon if a few less people are logged on to run it for a few people who didn't see it. Because um, we can also modify some things. We, do, we could explain how to move to other domains, and these types of things. Okay, um, now that we are done with the project setup and the forward simulations, we will now on, again move on to a more inversion focused aspect. And that is the data selection and the misfit definition. So if you're following along so far, uh, just click on part three, data selection and misfit definition. And it should hopefully just open this. And what this will do, it will quickly repeat a, a part of um, what Mike just did, but set up a mesh that's a bit more suited for, for inversions. And then we will um, use some synthetic data to compare it against observed data and pick pieces where they both are similar enough to make um, a meaningful comparison. Now I will explain what all of this means a bit later. So same as before this notebook, it has exactly the same just kind of parameter set. Um, it's very important here is like the solvers flow site. I'm sure Mike mentioned this. If you would change this, for example, to your local supercomputer site and you have set it up within solvers, this will just dispatch jobs there and take care of all the communication with the remote cluster. Um, then we just as in the second notebook, we will open the existing project again. So the same path that will open. So it's already, and we have in Brush, we have this persistent data structure. So it is aware of all the things that happen. So we can, can split this work into multiple notebooks or multiple days and just, just keep going. Okay. Um, but also because everyone basically has half a cluster, we will, um, we set up the whole broad problem for, for 11 events and maybe later show some results what happens with 11. But because we all want to run this, we will actually work for the subsequent steps. We work with work with um, a subset of events, and the way we recommend doing this is that you select, let's say, three about three events. That seems to be a good number. And of course, if you want to do this, you want to select three like um, decently well distributed events, right? So you can again look at the visualization. Um, it should show the event name, doesn't? But then you can pick some reasonably well distributed events. See how this works. Um, usually, this should show a pop up. Maybe that doesn't work because of the screen share. That should show you the name of the event. And for the purpose of this tutorial, we pre selected three events. What you could also do, you also open a new cell and just get a look at all the um, available events. So that's p events.list. That, that prints you all the events. You have previously added um, to the project. So those right now, those are six events. They have um, semi-descriptive names. For seismology, what usually does it takes the so-called Flynn, it figures out where the event is, takes the uh, Flynn Engdahl region, which is just a naming scheme seismologists developed for various regions on Earth. Um, most, most things are familiar. And then it adds the magnitude as well as the origin time. So this gives you a unique name per event. But that's just a detail that's not really important for the rest. But that's here how we identify events. And we will just select um, three events. I mean, again, feel free to choose different events or all of them or one of them. But then, you of course, have to deal with the consequences. If you use all 11, it just takes longer to run the whole thing. If you use only one, the inversion result will be a bit weird. So, recommend at least, at least two, maybe three. Um, this thing here is just for our own, our own sanity. We just want to make sure that we have whatever string we put in here is actually a valid event so it doesn't throw some errors later. And that all this does, it loops over this list of events and makes sure that the event exists in the project. Okay, but this should just work. If an error shows up, the event is not part of the project right now. Okay, now we will do the same thing that Mike did, but we'll set up um, a bit of a simpler mesh just to actually use it, um, just to actually see some um, some inversion, some some result of the inversion in the end. So we again, as as before, we set up the waveform simulation configuration, and these are kind of all parameters that are um, not sources, not receivers, not the domain, 
These are kind of things that are specific to waveform simulations, but don't really fit into any of the other schemas. And yeah, this, but this also feeds directly into Salgos also says waveform simulation objects deeper down. This kind of feeds right in there. So here we only use it for the attenuation. So we do want to run a viscoelastic um, simulation. And we set this to, we set this um, and we set the end time because we want to simulate X seconds. And then this is, I guess it's pretty similar to what Mike did before. It's just this really, this is all you need to do to tell Salvos how to simulate. This defines your mesh, interpolates the models, puts topography, bathymetry, all these things you've seen from Mike. From Mike. Um, the difference to Mike is that we will not use a 3D starting model. Um, and the only reason for this is really that we want to see some result of the inversion. If we start with a pretty good 3D model, we cannot realistically expect to improve this in 15 minutes. So we choose just a one-dimensional model. This is an extremely simple version. This is just the anisotropic prem model uh, with the crust layer removed. Just so we get big events, the simulations are a bit bigger elements, the simulations are a bit cheaper. Um, just a few other things here. We, we do use um, topography, also it's really hard to see at the scale. And we also use um, ocean loading. And the same as Mike did before. Um, we choose, um, this is the source term function we use here. Um, this is a bit of a special one. Um, and also I'm not gonna go into many details, but you need to make sure that the source term function matches the way you process your data. And the reason for this, if you do not do this, you have to process your synthetics as well. And then you have to derive the adjoint sources for the process data, which means you have to find the derivative of the processing operator, which um, is just nasty. So we really try to avoid this. And that's just one way you can do this. Again, if you go on our, um, on our website, there are actually tutorials, whole tutorials, they explain why this is important. But just for an actual version to work, you have to make sure the source and function matches the processing of the data. Otherwise, you can kind of comparing apples to oranges. And then we do the same thing as before. We add this simulation configuration. Oh, yeah, I did not execute this cell before. Also in Python, don't get scared of the error messages. Just have a look at this and read the very last thing. And you see here, okay, this thing is not defined, of course, because it did not execute the cell. And now it works. Now I have this initial model, 70 seconds, 120 seconds. I have this as simulation configuration. I can also visualize this. And now we also actually visualized only for, for three events. And also notice really a lot of things are, are going on here, especially it does, does create the mesh, it does add the topography, it sets up the whole thing, and then shows you what the actual setup it will run looks like. So that is the spherical chunk mesh we will use, um, sources, receivers for these three events. And, yeah, and you also see like, for example, the ocean loading is active, all these different parameters are interpolated. There are a Q kappa and Q mu for the viscoelastic part simulations. And the various other things we're doing now. But uh, Mike talked about this and we can now move on. What we'll do now, we will now, instead of running this only for um, a single simulation, we, uh, sorry, a single event, we'll use the same launch command for, for three. And so we'll do the same thing, but just for multiple ones. The cool thing here is if you would have a cluster which can run many jobs in parallel, this would automatically fan out. So if you do this for 100 events, and your cluster support, support some form of job array, we'll just run all 100 simulations in parallel and get the results back for you. And try to submit this in a fairly optimal way. Uh, one tiny detail here is that we actually, you don't have to do this, but we know we later want to use an inversion. So we can already um, compute the checkpoints. This basically stores a version of the forward runs we can later compute um, the kernels. This is not strictly necessary. It would also happen automatically later in the inversion if those don't exist yet, but it just saves a bit of time. Um, if you do this, it should be pretty quick. Um, I'm actually running this at my local workstation, which has a pretty nice GPU. So this runs really fast. So it will take a bit longer on, on the cluster. Also, so again, in a pitch that's all for, it's really a well-suited workload for modern GPUs. So this really only takes a few seconds per event to run on a decent sized GPU. You see we already have one finished, one is running. Now the third one is running. And we only run on a workstation, so we run the events in sequence. But again, if you go to a bigger cluster, you just can fan this out and distribute it. And then also bigger things could be done in a short amount of time. Okay, this for you, I expect this will take around three minutes if you run on the uh, training cluster, it just takes a bit longer. But I guess I can just quickly talk again what actually, um, what happened here just is this, it basically, well, it already built the mesh, so it takes the copied mesh it has, 
copies it to the cluster, prepares the job file, submits the job file, and monitors the job while it's running. And this already happens without having to do a lot of things. And also an important thing is that a lot of the um, validation of the inputs to see if the inputs are valid or not happens all locally. So if, for example, you misspell any kind of parameter or you add incompatible sources, for example, you could add an acoustic source to an elastic medium, many things will already be caught up front. So you don't ever run this issue where you submit a job, you wait hours in the queue, and then it doesn't run because of some avoidable error. Um, but then we launched these three um, jobs. They're all done. You can see in the widget, all three are, are download, actually already downloaded to the local machine and the cluster is cleaned up. And then we can have a look at this. And the way it's just the same as before with the um, this waveform visualization notebook. So just in terms of namespacing, that's the namespacing. That is the current project we work on. That is the visualization. This is a shortcut for the visualization components. And then we have some notebook specific visualizations because we operate in these Jupyter notebooks because we kind of like it. And then we just want to view the waveforms. We want to view two different ones and we want to view the displacement receiver field. And what we're doing here, we're again comparing the process data that we set up in notebook one. So this is the observed data that has been processed to the um, basic process, the, the instruments response has been removed and um, the Band, it has been a bandpass filter has been applied to limit it to, to the period range of interest. And then we also have a look at the um, simulated data. So this is just what we just ran here. Because if we do not add anything processed or external, we'll just assume it's synthetic data. So this is just what we ran before. If you click on this, you will um, again see actually like now you see this here, there's a message that I actually could not find the simulation for this simulation configuration. Uh, this is not an error, that's actually a feature, but remember we only simulated three events. And of course you will see the observed data, but you will not see the simulated data for events we did not actually simulate. So we actually have to choose one we did simulate. Um, I think that's the one we did. Yes, now this works. And let's again choose a nice station. I tend to like the GSN stations just because they have extremely high quality sensors. And you see here, and um, what you see here is uh, three components of the, uh, that's a Black Forest Observatory actually in Germany. So they're actually pretty close to Stuttgart. Um, and what you see here in, in, in blue, so you have this legend. So those, those are displacement in physical units, it's actually meters. And in blue, you see the process observed data. And in orange, you see the simulated data for our initial model. And in terms of simulation, in terms of inversion, what we actually want to do, we want to, compare both and minimize the difference between both. So we want to make sure that the orange one looks as much um, as similar as possible to the blue one. That is the goal of optimization we want to do. And this is a very nice example. Um, one thing that's pretty, but let's just find uh, not so nice one. Done. Yeah. Um, yes? Maybe also say, you know, this is time where people can ask questions and then we continue and they should give So a you're very quiet. Yeah. Yes, if they're fine, and then get a copy. That sounds good. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear that. Sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry, Leon, I was I wasn't on mute. That was me. Okay. Okay. Um, what was it? Okay. Uh, so now we actually before we had a very nice station. Now we have a not so nice station. So you still see. I mean, it looks kind of decent. But for example, in this region there, the, the blue one, the data is very noisy. And if you were to make a comparison between, or we actually would try to minimize the difference between the processed and or the observed and synthetic data, this would not be meaningful because you would basically try to fit noise or try to fit something that's not a proper signal. So what, what's really a crucial aspect in, in um, full waveform version is data selection. And this means it's really important which pieces, which waveforms you use, and which pieces of the waveforms you use to actually make a meaningful comparison. Right? And that's usually we, we call this data selection. This module basically boils down to window picking. So you want to pick windows in the data where both can be compared. And the type of misfit we'll use, I'll actually explain this a bit later, it's, it is a phase-based misfit. So we'll only optimize, optimize the phase difference between two signals. So we kind of ignore the amplitudes. But it still means that, for example, in this region here, you could make a very good um, comparison because definitely if you um, try to minimize the phase difference between the blue and the orange one, it would hopefully push the orange one here, make it a bit slower and push it to the right. 
Whereas, for example, here it becomes a bit more tricky to do a phase measurement because you only have one wiggle in the in the synthetics, but two in the observed data. So the frequency content is different. So what are you actually doing? And that means you really have to carefully select which piece of data to use. And in the realistic inversion, you have hundreds of events, thousands of stations. There's no way you can feasibly do this manually. So of course, there are um, automated ways of doing this. And some of those implements one way, there are different ones. And we're gonna, just for smart, we're gonna call this window selection. Just select on each, on each receiver, on each component, select the piece of data that is interesting. And the way this works, I mean, there, that's also partially in an area of open research, but the way this works here is that there is a function pick windows that would just hopefully do this for you. And it takes a few different things. Uh, basically what it will do, it will create a data selection configuration, which means it will store the computed windows into something we call a data, data selection configuration. And the data selection configuration in Salvos is just the sum of all data selection you do. So it is window picking, it is station selection. It are potentially having different weights for different um, receivers or different components, because you definitely want to maybe up weights from low stations, but down weights from stations and clusters. It all happens in, in data selection configurations. Then this command also takes observed and synthetic data because you need to pick on something. And the rest are actually mainly kind of detailed things, which I can explain if there's um, an interest in that, but let's just do this this afternoon. Um, the important thing here, again, we're talking about flexibility. So there's the window picking function. Here it's just a string that says built in, which means use the window picking function Salvos just has already implemented. But you can very well just define your own function that will then do the window picking. So if you have a special need and you wanna just try out what happens when you pick this and these and these and these faces to something very different, you can just add your own function and it will call that function to pick the windows. Here we do a small trial run and we actually tell the plotting function to just plot something so we can kind of understand how the algorithm works. Um, that becomes pretty important in an actual application because the algorithm has a bunch of tuning parameters. Uh, but what you can see it's doing and that let's just look at this one plot it spits out that is for the vertical component. Uh, what you see here is in red the observed sorry in black the observed data and in red the synthetic data and the goal is it picks windows and after the um, algorithm is finished it will have picked these two green windows as areas in that particular in these two particular seismograms where you can make a hopefully meaningful phase comparison so got rid of all these things at the bottom uh, uh, at the end it also didn't pick anything here it didn't like that one for some reason but you can figure out why here and what you see here, it like does um, a series of different elimination stages until only- Hello, Leon, and can you please zoom in? Yes, I can hear you. Can you please zoom in? Oh, zoom in, oh yes. Yeah. So, uh, I can make this bigger, yes. Is this big enough? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. But again, this would go too far to go into details here, but it's just a sophisticated window picking algorithm and the way it didn't pick this thing here is because it thinks there is potentially a phase jump in here at some frequency it didn't pick this because so, I mean the big issue is always for phase based management you don't you want to avoid what's known as cycle skipping you don't want to match a phase in one wiggle to the wrong one then the whole optimization will just go towards um, the wrong result okay um, but now we can actually this was just a trial to see if the parameters are feasible Pick some windows, looks okay. You would probably, if you do this at production, spend a bit more time tuning the, tuning the parameters, but so far this looks good. And then you can actually run the algorithm on all three events. And I actually should have done this before because this takes like uh, two or three minutes. So now would actually be a good, quite a good time for, for questions if there are some. Well, let's just, just keep talking. Okay, um, I guess let's talk a bit more about the window picking algorithm or the way this is called, but you can choose of course which events to run. And another important parameter is um, the window taper width. So once you have selected the window for the subsequent misfit natural source simulation, of course also you cannot just cut out this piece of data because then you have discontinuities at, at the end, which will introduce frequencies you don't like. So you have to taper this. 
but you can, you can set these things here. You can choose different um, receiver fields. So if you have data and you simulate it, for example, velocity acceleration or different fields, or also for acoustic media, the pressure, you can choose on what receiver fields you want to operate. Um, we tend to do displacement. Some people like velocity. And the results are actually pretty similar, hopefully. Um, yeah, there's really nothing else to say about this window picking algorithm is outgoing into a lot more detail. But this is really, there are many different algorithms to do this. Um, for example, for other domains, which are not seismology, you would use something different. And there, this is usually, um, for example, for, for exploration scale, you would usually pick the first arrival and then mute any energy that arrives afterwards to not have to do with this multiple reverberations. And in Salvos, this would not work with the um, window picking function, but it would work with a data selection configuration that you again can just define a custom function into that would do this for you. Okay. Um, yeah, now we'll just wait. Um, that's not two are done. Now the third one will start in a second. Um, this is a fairly expensive algorithm, so this usually takes a while. Um, the upside is you only have to do this once, really. You do this once at the beginning, then you pick the windows, and you might want to repeat this after a few iterations or once you move to a new frequency band, just to select new windows. And the goal here is also to pick as many windows as possible, but also importantly, not pick wrong windows. Because in the end, we are solving a mathematical optimization problem, and it will optimize for whatever you tell it to optimize. And if you tell it to optimize, um, for example, to fit noise or fit a wiggle that's just not there or fit the, the cycle skip wiggle, you will still get a result. The misfit will still go down, but the final earth model is not uh, physically feasible at all. And you will have something that's not interpretable and not useful for science. That's really the whole goal of this thing. Um, once you have the windows picked, um, there are usually always some issues for picking, for example, when components are missing or the instrument response fails or something. That's just all accounted for here. And you can check out the log if you want. Now you can analyze the results. Have a look at the waveform. That's just the same thing we did before. We again look at the observed data and the synthetic data, but additionally to before, we also pass um, the data selection configuration. That's just the one we just created by picking the windows. And let's again pick an event where we actually have synthetics. So one of our three. And let's just pick again favorite station. And what you see now here is that that's the same plot as before, but you have the windows actually highlighted. And, but now we, if you also actually were to apply the data selection configuration, you see it will taper around these windows and only a few wiggles will remain in seismogram. And that is the actual data that will be used to compute the misfits and later the gradients and drive the full inversion. So it's really what goes into the thing. But of course, also quickly, even here with only very few events and a comparatively small number of stations, it becomes clear that this does not scale to larger amounts of data. So of course, you would like to look at these things into like a more statistical or cumulative fashion. And there are also a few built-in kind of visualization routines that do this uh, statistically. Um, there's one for seismological windows, where you just call this visualization seismology windows function and pass in the data selection configuration that contains these windows. And this, for the events we actually have, that's just this one, for example, it will at this plot, um, show you what windows it picked for the whole event. And the way to read this plot is that on the x-axis is the time axis. It is the time since the event origin in seconds. So here it's when the event time happened. And that is how long, however long we have data. And that here is the epicenter distance from the station to the receiver in kilometers. And what you see here then is um, where and what windows have been picked. And the way to read this is this legend here. So you see here, if it's purple, you only have you only pick windows on the vertical component. If it's different colors, you might have picked only on a, one of the horizontal components or on a sum of components. So the best one is, of course, white. It means at this distance, at this time, you have picked windows on all three components. Um, there are kind of a bunch of, I mean, this plot shows a lot of things, a bunch of things to read into it. One thing is that, of course, if you go further away, the body waves get attenuated more and you tend to only see the P waves. So you basically see only the vertical component. The S waves get attenuated too much. You also see a distinct split between body waves and surface waves. And those are all good things. So you can analyze this a lot. You can see what's going on. You can see some statistics 
about the window, you can see how many um, receivers actually have windows. And if you notice here, there's the light kind of gray shade in the background. These are all the receivers you have. And so there are some receivers that did not have any picked windows for data quality or some other issues. Um, and this, of course, could be tuned a bit, but for now, this is definitely good enough. The next problem appears is that in seismology, it's not as nice as exploration scale or some other experimental setup. You tend to have um, very strongly varying station coverage. So you tend to have regions where the events are um, extremely clustered, you tend to have regions where you basically have no events, you tend to have the same for um, the receivers. So for example, your S array or, or ALP array, these are really have very dense networks. Then you have places where there are no stations, all especially the oceans. So you kind of need to account for this a bit because otherwise all the inversion will do is will optimize your data for regions where you have a ton of data. But of course you want to optimize um, everywhere. And the way you do this, you basically down way, um, give a lower weight to receivers that are in station clusters. And that is really just what this function does. Just calls a few things, there are a few built-in things. As always, flexibility is king. So you can always just as well define your own function here. And what this will do, it will assign a weight, and we'll have a look at this in a second, a weight to each receiver based on its distance to the next closest receiver. And this is what the next cell will do. It will scan a visualization component, it will show you the receiver weights on a map. And when you plot this, it will show you the same map as before. That is the same domain for one event. And what we see here color coded is, um, again, that's the event. The more saturated the purple is, the higher the weight of, this, of that particular station is. The key thing to note here is that isolated stations, like these things here, that don't have any neighboring stations, they get um, the highest weight because you don't have any others here. Whereas these cluster stations, they are downweighted quite a bit. So on average, you try to just even out the sensitivity of your measurements across the whole domain. That's what happens with this function. And again, it's as flexible and customizable as you want it to be. Um, but this kind of concludes the, at least for this, um, seismological setup, it concludes the definition of the data selection. So now we selected which pieces of the data to use and what weight to give to each piece of data for the final misfit computation, which then drives the inversion. So um, then the next also crucial part um, is defining the misfit. So mathematically defining how you want to uh, compare synthetics to data. So the very classical misfit is just to do an L2 norm. So you make take the difference of both and square that and try to minimize that. Uh, that works really well for some applications. For seismology, at least at these scales, most people tend to use um, a phase-based measurement. So it just um, analyze the phase shift of the seismic and tries to match that. It tends to be a bit more linear with respect to the structural model. That's what people like it. And importantly, it's somewhat independent of the amplitude of the signals. Because there are some things like, for example, very, very local side defects that otherwise have to account for. And also, as soon as you start to invert for um, amplitude, you might also have to invert for um, the Q model, basically the attenuation model, which adds more parameters to an already fairly underdetermined problem. Uh, the particular misfit we will use here, um, it's a time frequency phase misfit. So what it will, what it will do, it will take um, the data and this, the observed and the synthetic data, transform both into the time frequency domain. So basically at various different times, um, time snapshots and various different frequencies, you make um, a phase different measurement. That's quite advantageous because this gives you, you can make, you can have different phase shifts and different times of the seismograms and also different um, period bands. So you might have a phase advance for the very long periods, but actually a phase and delay for the high periods, uh, for the high frequencies. And then this will just kind of accumulate this all into one misfit measurement. But there are, and Excel supports a range of different ones. You can also, again, as always, define your own. And this really, this thing here defines what you actually want to measure and what you later on want to invert for. And once again, this is just um, the so-called configuration. What this takes, takes um, you gotta give it a name, you give it the observed data you want to compare it to. There are some misfit measurements that don't take observed data. For example, we just want to minimize the total energy or something, then you don't need observed data. Then you have to say which function to use. And um, if it's just a built-in one, you can just give a string. If you want to pass a function, um, these are just some extra parameters the function takes that of course differs based on the misfit. 
And last but least, you also have to, of course, the receiver field. And also, if you want to limit the data a bit. If you don't give this, we'll just use all the data, but we spent 15 minutes setting up the data selection. Of course, you want to use this. Um, you may also note this does not yet take any synthetic data, but that's just because you basically just define how you want to compare it to synthetic data. So only at the latest stage you need to feed in the actual synthetic data to um, do the comparison. So you add this to the project. Now the project knows how to do this type of comparison. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to look at how this looks on a map. And this is now very similar to the um, uh, the weight receiver as the station weight map. But now we actually plot the misfits on the geographical map. And what this takes, it just takes the data you want to have, so which you want to compute it for, and it's just our synthetics to the initial model, and it takes the just defined misfit configuration. And what you will get here is a map with the event again and the, um, the total misfit at each receiver. What this is, this is the um, window. It took every window, applied the window, made the misfit measurement on the window, and um, also computed, also applied the weights of the receivers, all the individual weights. This is really the final kind of integrated misfit a station has. And what you tend to see a lot of times is that you have a few stations having a much higher misfit than others, and many others don't have a small misfit. And that's okay, and that's just a way to analyze what's going on. So if you click on this, you see the station, you see the absolute misfit value, and you can basically click around and kind of try to get a feel of uh, what your data actually does. And this would actually be the end of the um, third notebook. I think we would have uh, two or three minutes for questions, if there are any. Um, but if you otherwise... define how isolated stations are just over the distance to other stations? Yes, there are. Um, that's, that's basically this function here. There are a few things you can take. Basically, you can apply many different functions at once. What we use here is um, uh, it's done by uh, uh, you. What's called you, you run. It's a part of your Prompts group. We wrote a paper last year of how to it's, um, do this. It's basically based, it's a distance measurement. It tries to estimate the, the density of the stations right around this receiver, around, around every receiver. And it just takes a certain, I mean, it's kind of nice because it works independent of the domain size. And you give this, um, what this parameter says is the relative weight of the largest to the smallest. Um, Way to give. So you basically say at most you want the um, at most isolated station to have three times the weight of the smallest weight of the station with the smallest weight. But really, it's just based on geometric distance. This first one. So if you have a cluster, that will give less weights. And then there's also a second one, which here doesn't do a lot, but basically this just will mute any receivers close to the sources. So if you have something that's really close to the source. Um, you probably don't want to make any measurements there first because the, for, the near field might have numerical issues, but also because then you might run into issues with um, the point source nature of what we're dealing with here. Yeah, you can also define your own function here and just do it all together. Yes. Could you maybe share in that paper? Um, yes, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put it paste in the chat later. Or maybe Mike Christian can just put it in the in the chat room. Oh, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? But otherwise, I would conclude uh, the third part, and then I would hand over to Christian. Uh, as always, because we're running this on a limited memory node, just try to close this uh, notebook, because especially for the next few, um, um, just close this, file close and halt, and make sure you don't have any other notebooks running, except maybe the first one, because now we we'll actually run the inversion, and the simulations will use as much memory as they can to buffer all the way fields. OK, but I would then hand over to Christian. And Why if you have more we, uh, advanced questions, you can also ask them um, in the afternoon. Why don't we take a five minute break, maybe bathroom break or, or yeah, a quick coffee break, coffee break and uh, continue at 1120 um, with, with the next tutorial. Um, okay, just, sounds yeah. good. And we, we try to wrap it up to still finish in time for, for lunch breaks. And again, if you have any questions, um, I mean, I guess the three of us will stick around now and will also be available in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, but I guess a five minute break is good. And we, we start over with the fourth part in, uh, in five minutes. And maybe for those of you who, who still don't have it working, um, we can spend two minutes just trying to get it to work.
Uh, one question. Sorry, one question. Uh, because of the problems with the cluster and everything and running the Jupyter, blah, 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 I decided to install Salvus on my computer. And I wanted to know if there is a tutorial with the data and everything that is, uh, I'm looking at the web page and I think everything is there, but just to be sure. Um, this particular tutorial, not, but we can, we can share this. We can share this off the workshop. Okay. Um, do, do you mean the notebook or also the, the data folder that we started with? So we, we can we can so the notebooks are actually set up in a way that they they fully reproduce from scratch. So like for these tutorials here, we we started uh, after downloading the data, so the event files and then the station and then actually do the waveforms, just because this takes about twenty to twenty five minutes that we didn't want to waste here. Um, but the the first notebook that Liam presented would actually do that. Um, so if the stations are not there already, um, you could you could directly start from there. And I think. Um, yeah, we, we can we can post the link to the shared directory on the on the cluster with the notebooks, and people can can just SCP it from there. Yeah. Thank you. Right. I guess it's time for, for part four. Um, 
yeah, I guess as, as before, um, if you have any questions, please interrupt any time. Um, if you were lucky to, to get a note on the cluster, um, feel free to, to just chug along. Uh, if not, um, I guess you can follow the, the presentation here. Um, let me share my screen. I hope you can see the browser now. Um, so just as a small recap, in case uh, one of the notebooks here from previous um, parts still appears as running, please close it first. I will shut down the, the kernel for the fourth one. I already have it running. I will shut it down again and then open it once more to, to have it running. Um, let me check if the if the font size is is okay. Uh, maybe I can increase it a bit. Um, so does this look good for everyone? I don't hear a no, so I assume it's it's fine. All right, so let's let's do a, a short recap of um, what we've done so far in the, in the previous parts, and uh, I'd like to bring up again this um, this overview that that Mike already showed in the in the introduction on Wednesday. Full waveform inversion is is a pretty hard problem for for many reasons. Um, in these tutorials here, we're trying to take a more application driven view. Um, although I guess it's clear to to all the participants here that at the core it is really a high performance compute problem. So we do require to run several simulations concurrently on potentially large compute clusters. Um, there's a lot of number crunching going on, but there are also several components that, that need to talk to each other to make an inversion run efficiently. So just to, to fill in some, some, um, some meaning to, to, these, uh, to this chart here is, in the first part of the tutorial that Leon did, and maybe I can actually annotate this a bit. Um, See if this works. So in the first part, this one, um, we looked at observed data. So as I said in the break, um, we, we did not technically start from scratch because we had already downloaded the data, but you will see all the commands in the notebooks that would have been necessary to really start from scratch, like from literally nothing to connecting to the data centers and get the observed data. And do some QC trying to, to figure out, you know, what a good data set might look like and how to compose the actual data that we need for the inversion. Then in, in step two, uh, Mike basically talked about, oops, sorry, <laughs> this part here, um, about the simulations. So we try to, to figure out how we can discretize the domain, attach sources and receivers to it, apply or attach a potentially 3D model account for all the physical effects that we want and then run the synthetic simulations to create a synthetic seismogram at all the stations that we have measurements for. So this is an important step and this is what we did in, in part two. Part three then again covered this part here of how do we compare synthetic to observed waveforms. And Leon said this is, this is a quite tricky problem for waveform inversion is known to be a highly nonlinear problem and there's really a lot of art going into how we formulate the problem and how we compare synthetic seismograms to the measurements that we have. This may involve different choices of misfit functionals, processing, weighting, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know to what extent you were able to, to follow these tutorials in this really short amount of time. Um, just keep in mind that you know, we walk you through here um, to some reasonable choices of many parameters but each individual bit and piece of those can be adjusted and can be customized to a certain data set or a certain application. So the goal of, of, uh, of what we do here is really to provide a framework to do full waveform inversion. Um, it's certainly not a black box and many bits and pieces need to be adjusted depending on what problem we're trying to solve. So what's now missing in, in the fourth part is, is basically what we have down here below how do we go from a current guess of what the actual Earth might look like to an updated Earth model that matches the data a bit better? So this is what we want to do in this, in this fourth tutorial here. You will notice that there are not that many cells that we actually need to, to execute here. Um, and this is because most of the actual work has already been done. We have made many choices how we want to set up our problem. And now it's mainly executing this loop here of iterating and running simulations over and over again until we reach a better model. 
So let's start again. I mean, this is just the same code block that you've seen before. And the only reason why we always introduce that at the beginning is to really just emphasize that if you wanted to tackle a different data set, maybe a more regional domain, um, except for the first notebook, all the other notebooks mostly only require you to modify these settings. And you would already work with a pretty well-defined configuration that will allow you to select windows, compare data, and eventually do an inversion. So we have executed this. And now, depending on, on what your choice has been in the previous notebook, um, you have to select the same events here. So in case you didn't change them, just execute the cell. If you were feeling like you don't really like the events at uh, Crete, uh, Iceland, and, and uh, the Strait of Gibraltar, make sure you have the same choice here that you made in the previous tutorial. If you didn't change anything, that's fine. Those are the three events that we considered. Now, of course, we, we don't claim that you know, what we do in these four hours here is an actual continental scale full waveform inversion. We consider here only three events only in the interest of time and because we do have the limited computational resources. Nothing would really change except for maybe the period band that we would be looking at and the number of events or data that we consider in total. Um, so keep in mind, we, we do not expect to get a great model out of an inversion or a couple of iterations for only three events, but the workflow is the important thing that we want to bring across here. So let's again uh, do some, some Python imports. And then you've seen this multiple times in the previous tutorials, we just reload the state of the project. And, and just to emphasize this again, for when you talk about the inverse problem, this really, really becomes important to have some form of state of what is going on with our inversion. If we do individual simulations, we might as well just always restart from scratch to make things reproducible. Within full waveform inversion that might potentially burn thousands of node hours and run for several days, maybe weeks, um, it is really important to, to maintain a state of the ongoing version. And this is what project does behind the scene for us. The more mathematical question now is how do we actually define our inverse problem in such a way that we converge to a good or a reasonable model? I mean, you all know that full waveform inversion is a highly nonlinear, non-convex problem. So we really need to design carefully how we set up the optimization problem in order to converge towards something meaningful. And the components of an inverse problem mainly split up into, into those four different pillars, I would say. And they, again, refer to the ones that we've seen up here. So first of all, there's, of course, a question, what kind of data do we invert for? So we need to make a selection of events, and we need to make a selection of how we compare synthetic to observed data. And basically, everything I'm talking about here will enter into the inverse problem configuration, so our specification of the inverse problem. So I will, for now, um, keep the focus on, on this cell, but keep in mind that we will just pass on this information in the following one. So once we have defined the data, the question is, what do we start from? And what, what information do we have about our model? I will say a bit more about that um, while we're already running the iteration. But uh, one important thing to start with is, for instance, what is our prior knowledge? So what is the currently best model that we um, can guess and that we want to start our inversion from? And another important question is, you know, which parameters do we actually want to invert for? In the end, the wave equation will see the elastic tensor and density. But what are actually the, the parameters that we think the data is sensitive to and we think that we can invert uh, iteratively during the course of the inversion? Um, then, of course, is like, like the, the more technical side. I mean, how, what, what kind of optimization method, mathematical optimization method, do we choose to find a better model, given that we have our current uh, synthetics and maybe some, some sensitivities? Uh, again, I will, I will say a bit more about this later. And then the workflow aspect. And, and this is something that, that in, from an application point of view, I think should really be abstracted away. I mean, there is no point in running a large data-driven inversion and still fiddling around with a job queuing system or with juggling around uh, data files, or syncing data back and forth, uh, adjusting scripts. So the workflow management is important. And in my point of view, it's more like an engineering task um, that is not really necessary to, to spend a lot of time on or should not be necessary to spend a lot of your time on. So how do these parameters now enter into our inverse problem configuration? Um, we have made our selection of events. Um, we have already created a misfit configuration in the previous notebook. So we just pass on the name of this misfit configuration here. 
We choose the prior model, and I mean, the name here is initial model, but keep in mind, this was the, the prem model that we've been using so far. And um, looking at, at, at seismic data and, and the way we compare synthetics to, to observed data, uh, we find that we are typically most sensitive to the seismic velocities. So we do uh, a time frequency phase misfit. So we are sensitive to phase shifts, and this directly translates to, to velocities. So as a set of inversion parameters here, we choose the um, shear and P-wave velocity. And as you remember from the second and third notebooks, we have a, a transversely isotropic medium. So we do have different velocities in horizontal and vertical directions. And here we were inverting for all four velocities at the same time. Uh, we are not uh, inverting for density, for instance. Um, and I'll say a bit more about the other parameters later on, um, as well as the, the other configurations that we have here. The only thing I want to, to stress here is the, the site config. So this is, this is the workflow aspect. Um, here we just specify where we want to run the simulations. So from abstract point of view, the inverse problem will only query misfits or gradients. It will never directly ask for certain simulations. So we just specify where we want to run these simulations. And here we run this locally on the compute node. But at the same time, this could be a different cluster, a different workstation. I, for instance, will run it on, on a single GPU on a, on a small workstation, and how many ranks we want to have here. And we could dispatch jobs to different machines at the same time. If there are some tasks which are cheaper to solve, for instance, we could do them locally and only send the expensive jobs to, to a cluster. So there's really a lot of flexibility where jobs are being done, and, and we don't really have to worry about that here. But let's start with, uh, with an actual the first iteration that we want to do. Um, like this cell doesn't really do anything instead of like saying, well, now I want to have a new iteration. Um, and uh, what we can always do, and I think this is, this is quite helpful from, again, an application point of view is, is visualize what is actually going on. Now, we only have collected the, the setting of the inverse problem and added an iteration. So what we see here is actually pretty boring. You will see this, um, extending over the course of the inversion, how we uh, internally construct an inversion is as a tree of iterations. We really want to be flexible. It is it's not really possible a priori to know, you know, what is the best selection of events? What is the best way to compare synthetics to observables? And we really have to modify things on the way. This is, this is actually the scientific part of it. And this is something that we cannot just treat as a black box and, and choose a priori. So the flexibility is, is needed, and this is why we, we want to have the ability to branch off and modify things as we're going. And this is why we, we do this inversion tree. Um, the misfits have not been registered yet with the, um, with the inverse problem, but you remember that we have computed them already, so you will see that we'll not need to do any additional forward simulation. Um, and here in the second tab, you basically will, will always see a preview of what is actually going on in the inversion. So you will see a preview of the model and some, some additional information that I will um, explain later on. So as I said, there, there are many tasks involved in, in, in stepping through an iteration. And sometimes you really want to monitor closely what is going on. And you can really do it step by step with this resume function. So this resume function will basically check what is the current state of my inversion or a certain iteration? What do I need to do next? What is the next task? And then maybe there are some simulations required. So we'll dispatch those simulations. Um, maybe there are some other computations required, like for instance, evaluating the misfit. And it will do it and return each time there is something more expensive that we need to wait for. So if I launch this for the first time, I get some some information about what is what is going on. It says resuming iteration zero. So that's the first one that we have added. This is now something that you hopefully will not see on, on your machine. So if you have run the, uh, the third tutorial and you said, I want to have checkpoints, then we would should skip the forward simulation. Um, I, do, I do it on a different machine. And I have to admit that I didn't run the third notebook. So this is why it automatically recognized I don't have this checkpoint information, so I need to redo the forward simulation in order to retrieve those checkpoints for the three events that are running. And you can see that, that this cell basically exited with the information that we have launched new simulations for three events, and you have to check again. So resume will always come back. You want to be able to shut down the notebook, go home, 
and then later on check on the status of what the jobs have been doing on, on a different cluster. So I can I can hit this cell again. And you know, if you do this on the cluster, this of course will be a bit asynchronous depending on how fast your jobs are running. Um, the analysis again, we're resuming iteration zero. We are processing the task for computing misfits and gradients. Um, you see that the cell is still running. So something is going on in the back, which in this case is the computation of the misfits. Again, keep in mind, you should already have the misfits. I don't, so I need to wait for the misfits here. Um, but now it has been taking its time, which was uh, for the misfit computation. Now it says again, submitting jobs, uh, submitting job array with three jobs. This is what you have should have seen in the in the first cell already, and this time we do adjoint simulations for the three events. So um, that's maybe a good time to talk a bit about um, how does full waveform inversion work, and how do we compute sensitivities of the misfit functional with respect to changes in the model parameters. Um, I think if you've seen this already yesterday in the spectrum tutorial, if you follow it, and um, maybe just very briefly, what is what is the concept of of adjoint method? Uh, methods uh, to, to compute gradients or, or sensitivities. Um, the wave equation is, is a time-dependent partial differential equation, and we typically distinguish between forward and adjoint runs. The forward run starts at time zero, and it basically goes all the way until the final time. We might save some um, seismograms on the way that we can then use to compute misfits. Now, in order to compute gradients, that is the sensitivity of how would the misfit functional change if I perturb my model anywhere in the domain or any of the model parameters. There is an efficient way to, to compute those sensitivities at the cost of solving the so-called adjoint equation. The adjoint equation is also a wave equation, so that's good news. We can reuse the same solver. The bad news is that it runs backward in time. So that alone wouldn't be a problem but the issue that we have is that in order to compute those gradients, we need to access the forward and the adjoint wave field simultaneously at every time step. So if we were to just like reverse the order of the forward simulation and basically go backward um, with the adjoint simulation, we would require to have the info if we did basically this one here, we would need to store the entire forward wave field in order to be able to compute those gradients. And storage here really explodes very, very quickly. So it's, it's if you don't have a good intuition for it, you can easily create terabytes of data, uh, keeping in mind that we have multiple events, potentially high frequencies. So this is something that is, even on, on the largest supercomputing systems, not really affordable to do. We cannot afford to store the entire forward wave field. But we can be a bit smarter about it, and this is where, where checkpointing comes in. Checkpointing would store snapshots of the wave field, that will then later on allow us to restart this of the forward simulation from these checkpoints. And let's say we have enough memory to, in RAM to buffer a quarter of the entire wave field in RAM. Then we could say we, we store four checkpoints, we restart the simulation here, we do the forward simulation, keep it in memory, then we do the first part of the adjoint simulation to compute the contributions to the gradients, we throw it away, move on to the next checkpoint, compute it for the second interval, move on to the third one, part of the forward simulation, part of the adjoint simulation, and move on to the last one. So this is really an efficient technique to, to compute um, these sensitivities, and we're basically trading away uh, memory requirements for additional computations. And especially with GPU clusters, um, the majority of the time is spent communicating data or um, waiting for memory access. It's not really the computations themselves. So depending on your hardware, this really is a lot more efficient than storing the entire wave field in, on disk. So that was in brief what is, what is going on in, in, in the back. Um, let's see how our uh, iteration is doing. Um, oh, sorry, I should. Erase the error here. OK, so um, we made some progress. We now have a summary of uh, iteration 0. Um, the chi is the misfit value. So uh, we, we have computed a misfit. We have the norm of the gradient. So also the gradient is now available. Um, and we, we have definitely made some, some progress in our, in our inversion. So let's take another look at the inversion tree and, and how this has evolved so far. We still have only one iteration here that looks a bit boring. 
we do have more information now. So if I hover over it, it will tell us what is the misfit configuration, what is the misfit value. The actual number may not tell us a lot, but we will later on use it to compare it to subsequent iterations. And we see we have used three events and get some gradient more. Um, looking at the misfits, again, if we only have a single iteration is, is not too interesting. But what we see here now nicely is how the individual events contribute to the total misfit. And we can see with the selection of events that we did so far, they're not too different from each other. Uh, keep in mind that through the data selection, these things can change quite significantly. For some stations, we might not have been able to choose windows, so they would not contribute to the misfit value. For others, maybe we have a lot of stations, but only clustered closely together, so they are downweighted. So the composition of the total misfit value really depends on a lot of ingredients that we've chosen in the, in the third tutorial already. So it looks that we are on a good track, but um, we still haven't, haven't really made a lot of progress. So maybe we want to do now a few steps, um, like write one after another, instead of always returning back to the notebook. And this is what the, the function iterate would do. It would basically just internally call resume over and over again until either the timeout is reached and it will basically query the, the new status every 20 seconds or whatever number we provide here. So again, on the, on the cluster, um, I, uh, it, it's a bit hard to, to know where you are currently in your, in your iteration. Um, the good thing is, is if, you, if you just execute this cell here, it will make sure to run the entire iteration until a model update has been accepted. And this gives us now time while this is running to, to talk a bit about how we determine model updates. And this is something that I, that I skipped uh, in the configuration of the inverse problem buff. We see here that the current task is we are processing the task of a, applying a preconditioner. And this is important because for full waveform inversion, the sensitivities, the raw gradients that we're computing, they usually contain a lot of artifacts and small scale features that we wouldn't necessarily attribute to actual structure in the Earth's subsurface. So smoothing plays an important role here. And um, the, the tricky part with smoothing is that um, we might want to smooth different parts of our model quite differently. So we have, um, as you summarize a, a, few, a few notes on this in, in, in this image here, um, if, you, if you think about conceptually, what are we expecting to ideally retrieve from full waveform inversion? Then we see that the expected resolution is, is inevitably tied to the wavelength. So a wave can only see something that is proportional to, to its wavelength. Small scale structure is just invisible to the wave. What this means is that we want to retrieve rather smooth models that are smoother in areas where we have long wavelength because we do not expect that the waves will resolve these features. And this is exactly what we do internally. Um, we solve an auxiliary equation and a fusion equation with anisotropic and space dependent coefficient, which allows us to smooth different in different areas and in different directions. So as you can see in this image here, um, the structures, this was a completely random model that we have smoothed. And the structures are much smoother in azimuthal direction than they are in radial direction. And this is because we have specified longer smoothing length in these azimuthal directions. What you would also see is that we would smooth a bit more in deeper regions. Deeper regions, we have higher velocities. The wavelengths are longer. This is why we cannot expect to retrieve the same fidelity of the model at, at greater depth. And if I scroll up again to how we initially set up the proper project, uh, sorry, the problem, we see that those are the settings that we specified for the preconditioner. We said we want to smooth the model and we want to make this model dependent. So we take as a reference model, the prior model that we put in, which is prem in this case, and use anisotropic smoothing length, which here, um, so anisotropic in, in the Cartesian reference frame, um, which are about half a wavelength uh, for all of these parameters. And of course, if we talk about wavelength and want to have something on a spatial scale, we need to relate it to the frequency. And here again, we choose um, the minimum period or the frequency that corresponds to the minimum period in our um, data selection or in the processing. And so you want to smooth the model uh, everywhere about half a wavelength of standard deviation. But of course, this means that if we have higher velocities, we will have longer wavelength and at deeper regions, the model will get smoothed more. 
All right, moving on. Um, so there, there, there would be a bit more to say about how we actually determine the model update. Uh, maybe this, this is a bit of too much information. We can leave that for the, for the Q&A session this, this afternoon. So just in short, we, uh, we uh, apply this preconditioner inside an LBFGS approximation of the inverse Hessian and tie it to a trust region method. So those are a lot of, of, of keywords thrown at you all together. Um, the, the, the key take home messages are is we, we use an approximation of the Hessian to retrieve curvature information. This is very important to get better model update directions. We apply the preconditioner to obtain smoother model updates. And we have the trust region method, which gives us control of you know, how, by how much should we update models between two subsequent iterations and give us a way of, of steering the, the iteration flow and, and to what degree we allow model updates to happen between two subsequent iterations. There's a lot more to, to talk about here, but I guess in the interest of time, uh, we leave it as it is. What we see now above here for the iterate functions, it has finished. So um, we uh, solved the preconditioning step. After this one, we got a new task, which asked for a new misfit. And the misfit value um, that was required is actually for the proposed model update. And in order to reject or accept this model update, we need to compute a new misfit for, for this model. So a new misfit requires new forward simulations, which have been submitted in the back. Um, and you can see it timed out once, then it queried the status again. At some point, the um, simulations were done. We were able to compute a misfit. And now we see the old misfit. This is the value that we've seen up there. It's almost 4,000. And we have been able to find a new model where the misfit went down to 2,500. So a pretty significant reduction of the misfit in the first iteration. And this led to acceptance of the model. So we now have actually our first new model update. And uh, I hope that you're curious how this will look like. So of course, we will just visualize the the status of the inversion again. Now there's actually a bit more to see. We went from our initial iteration to the first one that got a new ID. And um, let's see how we did with the misfits. So the total misfit indeed went down quite significantly. We've, we've seen the numbers above. So the number above is scaled by the number of events. So take this times three and you end up with uh, the numbers that we have here. And if you look at it uh, event-wise, and you can toggle the legend to basically now we're there to basically uh, see which which events are which, and we see that all of them have reduced their misfit. That's good. Interestingly enough, um, the one in Creed um, has a lower misfit reduction as the one in Gibraltar. Again, we're not really claiming here that that we're providing reasonable model updates here with only three events. But it is it's good to see that like all the components are playing well together. Um, we have found a model update, which at least fits the data better. So if we're not happy with the model update, we would have to choose a different data selection, different number of events, uh, or a different configuration of the inverse problem. But inverse problem itself is doing a good job. It is reducing the misfit, and this is what we want. So um, get some, some more detailed numbers here about how the individual misfits look like. Uh, but of course, like this is, this is one important aspect, how the misfit evolves over the iterations. Um, but more interesting is, of course, how, how actually the model looks like. So here you have a drop down list. You can select the different iterations. So it, it automatically jumped to the, to the last one. Here we only have a preview. So um, you know there, there's not that much to be seen. Um, but what I want to point out is if we, for instance, choose uh, VSV, um, the color scale here is adjusted to the entire domain, but we can use the column at bounds here to basically make it shrink a bit. Um, then we see that indeed the model has changed. We started from a 1D model. So this has been constant in the first iteration, uh, in, the, in the initial model. And now we actually do see some structure appearing. We can still see quite some imprint of the events. Um, but, but at least um, the model, model uh, is, is going in, in a direction that reduces the misfit. Um, I want to show uh, a few more details about what is, what is going on with the models. Um, but before we do this, um, all right, or maybe, maybe let's, let's take a look at the, at the gradients first. Um, so the gradients that we have been computing before we were able to update the model indicate how we need to change um, the individual parameters in, in the model space 
to reduce the misfit. So here we can again select VSV. We see the, the, the station selection. I mean, if this is annoying for you, you can um, toggle the sources and receivers to get a clearer view. And we see that the raw gradient really has a lot of sensitivity at the source location. If I toggle on the source, so this is, this is you have a drop down here to select the event. You're looking at the event in Crete now. And we see that most of the sensitivity is centered at the source location. I mean, this is expected. Um, like all the energy is emitted at that location. So this is where the model is most sensitive to. Of course, from application point of view, we, we don't really want to update the model close to the source location because here also the approximation of the, the source that we do is, is probably not very good. But we want to have or retrieve sensitivity in the other parts of the domain. If I adjust the color scale a bit, we indeed see that, I have to do it more, that if I, if I go down to, to smaller numbers, we do have sensitivities in, in a wider area of, of our domain, but the magnitudes are much, much smaller. So there's something we should do about that before we actually update our model. We can also execute the next cell and look at the combined gradient of all the events and see if that got any better, but it didn't do at all. Or maybe a little bit, you can now see three heavy imprints from the sources. Um, and again, if I adjust the color scale a bit, you will see that some sensitivity is popping up. But well, we do have these uh, high sensitivity regions around the sources, which would clearly lead to artifacts in, in um, um, an updated model. So what do we do about it? And, and this goes back to another parameter that we had up here. This is so-called mapping function. Uh, sorry, all the way up to the inverse problem configuration. So we make a distinction between the model that is interpolated onto the mesh and that we need for the simulation and the parameterization of the model that we use for the inversion. And we can tweak that model parameterization to like, define a space that is more reasonable for the actual, actual application that we're trying to solve here. So we would have different options to like, choose those parameter values um, either absolute or relative to the initial model. We have already made a selection of only a subset of the parameters that we're inverting for. And one additional ingredient that we put in here is that we want to cut out around the sources and the receivers with small spheres with a radius and not use that sensitivity to update the model. And this is part of, of the inverse modeling. We know from the application that this sensitivity, although it's mathematically there, is unreasonable from a physical point of view. So we want to get rid of this. And this is done uh, when we transform the raw gradients that we've seen in the widgets to the actual model updates and then also apply the preconditioning. So we can have a more closer look at that as well. Um, just in the interest of time, I would ask you to, if you're still following along, um, execute this cell once. This will just print a path that we'll need in a second, um, but then also immediately execute the next one. So what we do here is we basically just want to continue now. We're, we're happy with the setup. We don't want to change anything. We just want to do more iterations. And, and, and the only thing we do is basically just say like, continue and go. I mean, the, the job submission, the computations, everything uh, will be taken care of. Uh, we don't really have to worry here. We just keep running and, and, and later on check back and see you know, if, if we have made any improvements. We, we could even now cancel this, this cell pretty much at any time. Um, shut down the notebook and then come back, reload the project state and, uh, and, and see where, where we are and how we are doing. So, so being able to run inversions asynchronously, I think is really important, especially at large scales. It's, it's not something that you can just like uh, keep running on the same machine for, for a long period of time. So I, I hope what you, when you, when you have executed this cell here, it will print out a path and this path will actually show you uh, more of, of, of the models and the gradients and the updated model that we could now inspect in, in pair view. Um, so the widgets that we have up there, they only give you a preview. And most importantly, so far, we've only looked at the surface. And now clearly the surface is something that we're definitely not interested in in, in, in seismology. We want to know about the subsurface. So you actually need to look inside. And for this, we, we need a better tool than the widget and pair view is, is a great tool to do that. Um, in the interest of time, I don't want to take too long here. Feel free to download uh, either using um, uh, rsync or SCP 
the, this directory. It is pretty large, so it might, might take a bit of time. Um, or I would actually recommend to just follow along um, here within in the presentation. Just in case you're interested and you don't really like rsync or SCP, you can also just copy that path here, hop over to, to the other tab, um, and then this is a file directory structure. So what you could do is you can just copy and paste the path here. Oops. That's interesting. Copy and paste the path here, and it will take you to a directory where we now have two iterations already, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the first one. Now, if we click on this directory, we'll see a bunch of, of models here. And similar to the, the wave field file that, that Mike was showing um, in the, the third part of the tutorial, you'll always see a combination of an H5 file and the XDMF file. The H5 file, as you can see here, is actually the, the bigger one. So that's the one that contains the heavy data. The XDMF file is something that can be parsed by pair of you to actually know how to plot and, and, and visualize the data. So whatever you're interested in, make sure to always download both. What do we have here? We do have our initial model. So this is just prem. Then we have the individual event gradients for the three events that we have been considered or we have considered. Um, we do have some, some um, intermediate data that we required during the LBFGS approximation. So it's basically the sum draw gradient to which then the precondition is applied. So the precondition that we see here um, will contain the smooth model. And then finally, we do have, and this is here still labeled as a trial model, the proposed model that we, as you hopefully remember, accepted during the iteration and which will become the model of iteration one. So either feel free to, to download the models that you're interested in or just follow along. I, um, I did my homework and I, I do have them in pair of you already. So just let me share a different screen. Um, so yeah, I guess you, you can see pair of you now. Um, maybe we can open the, the preconditioned model. If you open pair of you, Mike said this before, make sure to always choose the XDMF reader no threes allowed, um, it will make Purview crash immediately otherwise. So choose XDMF reader, none of the other two. Unfortunately, depending on your operating system, the order is different. So do not choose the top one unless it says XDMF reader. So if we do this, um, we, can, we can plot the model and Purview is an incredibly powerful. I'm sure many of you are using it. We've been using it already in, in the other tutorials. Um, there's absolutely no time to do uh, a, a good introduction to pair of you uh, today. Um, just uh, something that we are particularly interested in looking is a depth slice. So we select the slice up here um, and hit apply. Oops. And then this would not be a depth slice, but we can select instead of plane sphere to get a different cut. And then for the sphere, we of course need to center it at the origin and then choose the radius that we want. And let's say we wanna look at uh, the model in 100 kilometers depth. So we put in the depth of 100 kilometer, hit apply, hmm, and we see something that is still homogeneous. Why is that the case? Well, we're not inverting for eta, so there's nothing to be seen here. But in the drop-down list over here, you can select all the different parameters. So depending on what you're interested in, let's say we again take a look at the vertical shear wave velocity select it, then we see, well, indeed, this looks much smoother than um, the raw gradients that we've seen before. But the raw gradients were at the surface. We can also take a look at the surface here. Need to, again, put VSV. Much smoother structure than uh, the ones we saw in the raw gradients. Still maybe the, a bit too much of an imprint of, of the individual events, but um, this will either resolve over the course of several iterations, or we might have to refine a few of the settings. So we could now um, select the slice, go to, to various different depths, let's say 200 kilometers depth, um, and we see that the, the structure is actually changing. Um, so we do get a model update, which uh, even at greater depth has done something to the model. Again, we're not claiming here that this is a, a great model update, uh, but at least the workflow looks, looks all right. We, we do get some model updates that significantly reduce the misfits. Um, the, the structure itself doesn't tell us a lot, but at least it's it's rather smooth, and uh, and we we seem to be on a on a good track. 
What else is there to look at? Well, what might be interesting is the actual accepted model. So again, this is still labeled as a trial model um, because, well, this was accepted later on, but at the time when the file was written, we didn't know yet whether this will be accepted or not. Um, so again, we select slice um, and then make it a, oops, sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Uh, make it a sphere, center it at zero. And uh, this time, how about looking at, again, 100 kilometer depth. That was one zero too little. And now this is, of course, for the first iteration, not, not too interesting. Um, because the, the preconditioned model that we've seen for the first iteration is just a flipped sign of the model update that we'll receive. And this is because at the first iteration, there is no curvature information that we can extract. LBFGS makes use of the previous models and gradients. So there's really not a lot to, to gain or to use other than the pure sensitivity information that we have. So not very surprising, the structures that we're seeing here are pretty much exactly the same that we've seen in the preconditioned model. Um, we can also look at other parameters. Always need to, to rescale a bit. So we do also see some, some different structure appearing for, for vertical and horizontal shear wave velocity. Um, P wave velocity the same. It does look much smoother. Keep in mind, we smooth depending on the wavelength. P wave velocities are higher, so we smooth more. And we, we, we might actually want to redo some of the iterations and using a smooth, uh, longer smoothing length for the S-wave velocity. Or alternatively, we could say, how about we only invert for one effective parameter that then maps into relative perturbations of the pressure and the shear wave velocity at the same time. We may not be able with this small data set to really distinguish the four different velocities all independently. So there are a lot of things to, to play around with. And this is where I think it's, it's really required and necessary that we have the flexibility in the way we set up the inverse problem and to maintain a state of, of, of the project. The term provenance came up already on, on Wednesday, um, keeping track of what we have been doing um, and you know, knowing how to fall back to a previous state or reusing information that we have already been computing for some other purpose is crucial to efficiently um, iterate or run there several scenarios in, in parallel. So let's uh, go back to our ongoing inversion and hope that we have made some, some progress here. So let's check this box. This was the one that, that um, we hit before we left to pair view. Um, so we said we were resuming iteration one and you know what would happen is in the first step, we would require misfits. But project is of course smart enough to know, well, we already have the misfits because that was the previous iteration. So we directly start now with the gradient. This is information that we don't have yet. So we reuse the checkpoints, compute the sensitivities and, and, and go along. And then um, this is the, the information that we have retrieved for the updated model. We apply the preconditioner again. Um, we launch new simulations to process the task misfit. So to, again, uh, compute new misfits for a trial model. We've been lucky the model has been accepted right away. And, and this is not a given. So we're still solving a nonlinear uh, inverse problem. So it might be that our trust region is too large, um, in which case the model would have been rejected and a new proposal model would be computed for which we again would need to evaluate the misfit. So uh, it should hopefully be, be fairly robust um, I'd actually be, be curious to know if any of you um, has done this uh, either at all or um, with a different selection of the events. Uh, if you have chosen different events, you will definitely see different values here. Um, I would hope that you would still get some, some reasonable model updates. Um, they, of course, will, will look different because you have sources and, and receivers at different locations. So also the, the second iteration, then we have some summary. We, we have accepted another model update. So this is great, which means we have now done three full iterations. Um, of course, we want to look at them. Um, we again have our inversion control center. Now it's still not really a tree, but just a single branch. Um, but we can see starting from initial misfit of almost 4,000, um, we have reduced it. The reduction, and this is typical for full waveform inversion, decreases uh, with, with, on, with uh, the more iterations we do. Um, here we see that, you know, indeed, there is, there's not too much progress. 
again, it's not necessarily expected with, with the way that we selected the events, but we at least do make some, some progress. And we can also um, take a look at the individual events. Um, all of them go down uh, in all iterations. Um, the, the smallest value per event is also reached at the third iteration. This is good news. Um, so it seems that, that we are on a good track and, and we are update, updating the model in such a way that we reduce the misfit. And again, the, the scientific question is, have we chosen the data set and the way we define a misfit in the appropriate way to find a good model? This is a scientific question that you know, is to some extent still an open problem. All right, so, so this looks good. Um, what's, what's left uh, today? And maybe I can have like five to 10 more and more minutes if, 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 if you're following along. Let's, let's just look at, at some, some of the results that we have obtained so far. So as a recap, we have done three simulations with three events on a continental scale inversion. So it's, it's, it's really not much. I mean, there, there are only a couple of simulations, rather long period data. Um, uh, and, and, and only three events. But we, we are comparing to real data and we were actually able to match those waveforms better with the limited setup that we have here, starting literally from, from scratch. So what we can see here for um, one of the events that I've selected here is, is just now an overview of all the individual stations. And this is again where a lot of, of QC might come in in the course of the inversion. Uh, maybe some of the stations contain bad data that you want to throw out. Uh, maybe maybe some of the stations you want to adjust the, the station weighting. Um, so it's, it's definitely important to check back during the, the inversion what is actually going on and whether some of the settings can or should be tweaked. What we see here is, is a comparison between our initial model and the first column, um, the misfit in the current third iteration and the reduction. And as we can see here, we see a lot of green, which is great. So a lot of individual stations also have reduced their misfit. So above, we've only seen the aggregated value per event. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that all the stations reduce their misfits. And indeed, this is not the case. We do see some stations where the misfits actually increase. This can happen for various reasons. Maybe um, we just haven't approached a good model yet. Maybe there is something corrupt about the data. Um, maybe the window selection did select some windows which we shouldn't really consider. Um, so if this happens occasionally, it's fine. If there's a pattern, we should definitely take a more closer look. Fortunately here, we're generally quite, quite happy. So for this event, the overall evolution seems fine. We can um, also take, take a little different um, perspective and view and aggregate um, the, the misfits now per station but do a histogram. So we had all the misfits per event, so only three numbers. Then we had a single event with many, many stations individually. Might be a bit hard to process if you now have all of a sudden 100 events. So histogram view might also be nice to see what, what is actually going on with all the individual stations. So what we see here are the, the um, selected, um, the, the misfits for the selected windows in all three components, in North, East, and, and, and Vertical. Uh, Keep in mind, you know, data that we do not pick windows for uh, is not considered here. So it might have gotten better or worse. We, we don't know. We only know about the windows that we've selected initially. We can see that the mean for the initial model was uh, at about um, 11.6. And now the mean went down to 4.38. So the per station misfit has been reduced by more than half, which is great after three iterations. And um, we do see a few more statistical values. Um, maybe the, the important one to consider is that in total, although we only have three events, we have chosen 351 windows. So there's actually quite a lot of data that is already contributing to, to this inversion. And of course, like with, with the, uh, on, the, on the first glance, this, this all looks pretty good. Um, the, the, the purple line or the purple bars, those are the, um, the misfits at our current third iteration and the orange ones are the initial ones. And you can see that all of them moved quite significantly to the left, which means that more stations now have a smaller misfit than they had initially. So this looks, looks promising. Um, a last view that we could also um, take here is to actually look at the waveforms. And this is something that is, it is really important. I mean, this is in the end what, what we're inverting for. And this is also where seismologists you know, take the most information from, um, which might be more informative than looking at 
you know, these aggregate values or, or histograms here. So let's take a look at, at some waveforms. In the text here, you will see a description of, of two particular stations that I, I would recommend taking a look at. Of course, you're free to browse through, through all the stations. Um, don't be, be scared off by this error message. We've seen this before in the, in the previous notebook. Um, we don't have data for uh, all the events. So we only selected three events. And this is why it's saying, well, for Greece, and unfortunately, don't know anything about like this model that we had at the, the third iteration. So I can't show you anything. I can only show you the, the process data. For the events where we actually do have um, data for third iteration, and one of them is the one close to the Strait of Gibraltar, we, um, we see now, uh, maybe move to the one station I recommended. Um, we do see three lines here. The blue one is the, the processed observed data. So this is the one that we are trying to match. Orange line is where we started from. So our initial synthetic waveforms. And the green one is the waveform after three iterations. And uh, keep in mind, like all we are trying to fit here are the windows that are shaded in blue. So all of the part like further down to the right or to the left is not really considered in the misfit. So it may improve or may not improve we wouldn't see this in the misfit values above. What we can see here is that we got a pretty spectacular fit for, for that period range after three iterations. So we started from orange. We can see that there's quite a, a phase shift compared to the true data. I know green and then blue line are in very, very good agreement in, in basically all three components. So given the, the limited amount of computations we did, um, at least for these particular trays, we, we did a pretty good job in, in, in matching those data much, much better than we did initially, um, just by using the information from, from three stations. And again, this is, this is not a synthetic problem. This is, this is actual earthquake measurements. Um, another station that I would like to, to show, this is, um, this is also fairly interesting. Um, so we see here, I mean, the, the improvement doesn't look that, that great. Um, it's, it's hard to see here for the photo body waves because the amplitudes are so small. I mean, here, maybe it got a little bit better. It's definitely not as spectacular as for the one in Great Britain that we've seen before. What is interesting, though, is if you compare those parts here and here, you see that even though those windows have not been selected initially, we were able, through the information that came in from the other events and the other stations, to also improve those waveforms here. So if we were now start to repick windows, maybe we get a chance of including more data automatically into our inversion process and really try to converge to more meaningful models by using more and more of most of the available data. So this is, this is definitely reassuring news. Um, given the, the limited amount of time, this is, this is pretty much the, the end of the tutorial that we have here. The final thing I would like to show you, though, is what would have happened if you know we did some things differently. And, and again, this is, this is where the, the seismology or the scientific questions in seismology come in. How do we define our inverse problem? So let me switch to another tab where I basically did exactly what we did, but played around with a few parameters. And then the inversion tree can get more complex. So at the bottom, you can see exactly the three iterations that we did now exactly the same values, exactly the same progress. But then I said, well, maybe, maybe three events is, is not a great idea. Um, I want to include more events and more data. So I started over with 11 events and did a couple of iterations there. And then during the process, I was thinking, well, maybe, maybe it's a bit expensive to use all 11 events in every single iteration. Maybe I, I switched the number of events up a bit and use fewer events in some of the iterations. And I, I can do that. I can just branch off. Um, reused information, so everything that has been computed in the previous iteration is still there. Project knows about all the simulations we've ever done and keeps those data. And then we can branch off and run different scenarios and we can even do them concurrently. So if we have access to, to a, a huge cluster, we could dispatch as many jobs as we like concurrently and run different scenarios. And I think coming back to the point that full waveform inversion is a highly nonlinear, non-convex and just really difficult problem this is often actually necessary to play around with different parameters to actually find the most meaningful configuration. And uh, just to show you here, so I can, I can now select different branches. Um, so here you always see the, 
the tip. So this is the, the, the final iteration that I did for a certain branch. So we have iteration 17, 15, eight or three. Let's go maybe to 15. This is, this is the longest one. This is the one with, with all the events. And we do see that you know, including more events um, also gives, gives a fairly reassuring picture um, where all the events seem to, to do fairly well. Um, the overall misfit is reduced. The individual misfits, if you look at the second um, image, are also reduced. Um, we haven't repicked windows here. This is probably something that we should do after a couple of iterations. And, and of course, this is not really, it's the end of, of today's tutorial, um, but it's, it's actually more like a start of a, an actual full waveform inversion, because this is where we would now really start to play around with different parameter settings to eventually also go up to, to much shorter periods and really try to extract as much information as we can from, from the models. That would uh, bring me to, to the end of my part. Um, happy to answer any, any questions right now. Maybe you can give a, a quick uh, yes or, or no if, if you've been able to follow um, either in the, in the notebook or, um, or, at least, uh, or at least follow me uh, with, with the presentation. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for attending. I'm happy to take questions now. Same for, for Leon and Mike, uh, and also in the afternoon in the, in the Zoom room. And uh, I think as, as Mike wrote in the chat, we would also be happy to go through uh, the second tutorial again for, for those of you who, who weren't able to, to get a node uh, allocation on, on the cluster. Thank you. Stop sharing. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, well, I hope that still means that you were able to follow and not have fallen asleep already altogether. Um, I actually don't know how the schedule continues. Um, I don't know, Mike Leon, um, you know? I defer to Jose for that. Yeah. Yep. So the schedule is that we're going to break now. Let me share my screen because there's a small change for this afternoon. Okay, so um, I have the honor to wrap up the official part of the workshop. And don't forget, we will have these uh, Zoom breakout rooms um, hosted by each partner, uh, by each code, by a team of each code um, from two to four, I believe. And uh, I'm just wrapping up. It's a complimentary <laughs> presentation about Arnaud just short, um, some closing remarks. And um, again, I also listed these, um, what she says, maybe in a nutshell, this, uh, as Arnaud said, preparing 10 community flagship uh, European codes for the upcoming pre exascale and exascale uh, supercomputers. And this is something you hear often if you have these uh, subdivisions where you're expecting to have the pre exascale machines um, available this year and the exascale supercomputers available uh, two years later. And as one of the challenges, if you're trying to prepare codes that uh, solid earth users use for these upcoming machines is that um, we have to kind of anticipate how the hardware um, look like in these machines. So it's not a super trivial task, actually, because they don't exist yet, these machines. We're still preparing for them. And um, you had a glimpse of these four codes that are listed here for computational seismology. So Exahype, Salvos, Sysol, and Spectrum 3D, using the Cartesian version of Spectrum. Um, as you can see, there's two codes from magnetohydrodynamics, volcanology, and tsunamis that are also listed here. <clears throat> and I also have a um, um, a few motivational slides. So for us as um, computational seismologists, we can, we can think about or dream about what can we learn from such computational seismology models if they run 1,000 times faster, like on an exascale machine. Um, and we are a given that um, we can properly address all the issues that are associated with making the codes faster and enabling um, kind of use cases that we call, call the use case that basically means having a workflow set up so that somebody can use the code and use the infrastructure readily for some uh, solving a geophysical um, solid earth problem and um, we could run the simulations bigger we can uh, run a lot of them and we can run them urgently and this is kind of my 
subdivision of, um, of these different services or pilot um, demonstrators that cheese is offering. Um, if you run them bigger, that could mean we just uh, increase resolution for tomography model. We might want to um, scratch mm -hmm. oh, let's, We only oops. see the title slide. That's not good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me try this again. Um, but you see the slide now? Uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, well, yeah. As of now, again, the title slide, but we see your whole. Exactly. Yeah, and now. Mm -hmm. That is weird. So we had a lot of, I think we had all Zoom challenges that you can imagine in <laughs> this remote training. Um, yeah, there's maybe a comment about this. So I, I think um, typically these training workshops, they are, I mean, they are run remotely, but typically really not for this amount of participants. So we kind of made a special um, case to allow that many um, trainees to, to, to be able to attend and there's still a long waiting list. So it's been, um, I think it's also challenging to come up with new designs of how to do that with breakout rooms and all these things. It's not, uh, not necessarily an easy task. So this is the table with the codes, the 10 community flagship codes and you had these four codes, um, you had some exposure to them. This is my, what can we learn from such models running 1000 times faster slide. Um, we're on the road to exascale, as you heard, we have these uh, ominous machines being built and uh, we have to prepare for them. Um, and we can dream big about what, uh, what they will enable us to do um, in case that we have some infrastructure that allows all of us to use them. So we can run them bigger, a lot of them or urgently. That's I guess where, how far I got. Um, for running them bigger, as I said, we can reach higher resolution um, higher frequencies, that often means in computational seismology, uh, we could change scales. So I decide here there's a, um, a model we've been running for understanding earthquake physics in very small geo reservoirs, but with a lot of fractures that can potentially um, break dynamically. Um, we can run a lot of forward models, <laughs> think about not only maybe adjunct tomography or full waveform inversion, but also about things like um, uncertainty quantification, adjoints in other contexts, um, optimal design, <coughs> ensemble simulations in a more advanced way than running parameter simulations and um, um, looking at all of the results. And of course, we can integrate, I write here earthquake physics, but it really should be um, um, solid earth uh, computational seismology applications into rapid response, not only earthquake, we have a lot of rapid tsunami response or volcano uh, volcanology response in the project. So with the calls that you've seen today um, in cheese, we don't only have these um, uh, infrastructure technical aspects, we also want to do some science. And um, I think I, I just put it in another order just to show like, which science questions we are addressing in the project with each of these codes. Um, so there's something called pilot demonstrator one, urgent seismic simulations, and we also had a slide. Um, it's really, it's led by ETH Zurich and, and by Marta who joined here. Um, and it's really about running um, computational seismology forward simulations based on point sources um, rapidly after an event happened. <clears throat> um, PD4 is another seismology related um, pilot that was not mentioned and that's about physics-based tsunami earthquake interactions. That relates a bit to the um, introductory slides we had for SISO where we're trying to capture better the interaction of earthquakes and tsunamis. And as I said, we're extending uh, some of the codes to do this all in one uh, in one model, and that will lead to problem sizes for which we really need these large machines um, to couple all of this together. Um, this is an example for a Hellenic arc scenario that we're working on. Um, and we have PD5, so that's the PSHA hazard assessment one, and here's a, an example of the Husavik Flatte fault zone, so those um, that are monitoring the seismicity in Iceland. They know that there was this summer, it was quite a lot of activity in the North Iceland in this very complex rupture zone. And um, yeah, we are running um, dynamic models for that, but we're also trying to find out how um, forward simulations or physics-based simulations can actually be integrated in uh, physics-based probabilistic hazard assessment, which is uh, often relying on empirical assumptions. And PD9 seismic tomography, and it's just another plot here. Here, but um, the spectrum 3D and Sal was trying to um, push the boundaries of what you can do in terms of imaging and tomography um, of solid earth. And uh, these were the slides that I preferred and I want to wrap up and thank all of you for staying also until now.
and especially um, thank Jose and the um, supercomputing team in Stuttgart for making all of this possible and Rose who actually did a lot of work in preparing the workshop and advertising it so well that we have <laughs> many more interest than I could attend and of course all the instructors that took out time of their research to um, prepare and conduct the training with you. So thank you very much for all of this. That's it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, do you want to take questions? You can applaud maybe. <laughs> Not me, but uh, the people, I think. <laughs> no. Yes. And so maybe then. I should have maybe shared the links again to the Zoom room. So maybe that's a good idea. If you could pre somehow bring that up, that people know um, in the chat, people know where to go. If they're feeling lost, training is finished. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I don't have the links. Somebody has the email open with the links for the Zoom room, that it's a good idea to bring that up. Maybe whoever can share them. I actually didn't get the email myself. Ah, oh, they're in the chat now. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so we meet there, I think, at 2. Yes, at 2 o'clock. So then for me, it's time to say goodbye uh, to most of you. We'll probably not see everybody in the uh, next sessions. It has been a pleasure to organize this meeting. I think it was, uh, for me at least, totally very interesting. I think it was a great success. I had the impression uh, all of you learned a lot. And I hope you we'll be able to repeat this and where well, there's huge demand for this kind of courses uh, as was said a couple of times already with at least another 120 participants on the waiting list so we could run this course uh, three four times over <laughs> uh, let's see whether we can do this and yeah it was a lot of fun for me and i hope to meet some of you at other occasions elsewhere so the plan now is to continue at two o'clock in this separate uh, Zoom meetings. Bye bye. Yeah, I just want to say again, thanks to Dave for setting everything up and organizing Thank everything, you. helping us out with the issues on the cluster, and of course getting it back online for everyone. Yeah, yeah. I will forward this to our administrator. They did a lot of work this morning. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks everyone for attending from the Salvas team as well. I uh, hope to see you in our little room and thanks to everyone else for the presentations too, very interesting. Okay, so um, I have the honor to wrap up the official part of the workshop and don't forget we will have these uh, Zoom breakout rooms um, hosted by each partner, uh, by each code, by a team of each code um, from two to four, I believe. And uh, I'm just wrapping up. It's a complimentary <laughs> presentation about Arnaud, just short, um, to some closing remarks. And um, again, I also listed these, um, what she's is maybe in a nutshell is that, as Arno said, preparing 10 community flagship uh, European codes for the upcoming pre exascale and exascale uh, supercomputers. And this is something you hear often that we have these uh, the subdivisions where you're expecting to have the pre exascale machines um, available this year and the exascale supercomputers available uh, two years later. And as one of the challenges, if you're trying to prepare codes that uh, solid earth users use, for these upcoming machines is that um, we have to kind of anticipate how the hardware um, look like in these machines. So it's not a super trivial task actually because they don't exist yet, these machines. We're still preparing for them. And um, you had a glimpse of these four codes that are listed here for computational seismology. So Exahype, Salvo, Sysol, and SpecFem 3D using the Cartesian version of SpecFem. Um, as you can see, there's two codes from magnetohydrodynamics, volcanology, and tsunamis that are also listed here. <clears throat> and I also have um, um, a few motivational slides. So for us as um, computational seismologists, we can, we can think about or dream about what can we learn from such computational seismology models if they run 1,000 times faster, like on an exascale machine. Um, and we are uh, given that um, we can properly address all the issues that are associated with making the codes faster and enabling um, kind of use cases that we call, call the use case that basically means having a workflow set up so that somebody can use the code and use the infrastructure readily for some uh, solving a geophysical um, solid earth problem and um, we could run the simulations bigger we can uh, run a lot of them and we can run them urgently and this is kind of my 
subdivision of, um, of these different services or pilot um, demonstrators that she's is offering. Um, if you find them bigger, that could mean we just uh, increase resolution for tomography model. We might want to um, scratch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's, we only oh, see the title slide. That's not good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me try this again. Um, but you see the slide now? Uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, well, yeah. As of now, again, the title slide, but we see your whole. Exactly. Yeah, and now. Mm -hmm. That is weird. So we had a lot of, I think we had all Zoom challenges that you can imagine <laughs> in this remote training. Um, yeah, there's maybe a comment about this. So I, I think um, typically these training workshops, they are, I mean, they are run remotely, but typically really not for this amount of participants. So we kind of made a special um, case to allow that many um, trainees to, to be able to attend and there's still a long waiting list. So it's been, um, I think it's also challenging to come up with new designs of how to do that with breakout rooms and all these things. It's not, uh, not necessarily an easy task. So this is the table with the codes, the 10 community flagship codes, and you had these four codes, um, you had some exposure to them. This is my, what can we learn from such models running 1000 times faster slide. Um, we are on the road to exascale, as you heard, we have these uh, ominous machines being built and uh, we have to prepare for them. Um, and we can dream big about what, uh, what they will enable us to do um, in case that we have some infrastructure that allows all of us to use them. So we can run them bigger, a lot of them more urgently. That's, I guess, where, how far I got. Um, for running them bigger, as I said, we can reach higher resolution. Um, higher frequencies, that often means in computational seismology, uh, we could change scales. So I decide here there's a, um, a model we've been running for understanding earthquake physics in very small geo reservoirs, but with a lot of fractures that can potentially um, break dynamically. Um, we can run a lot of forward models. <laughs> Think about not only maybe adjunct tomography or full waveform inversion, but also about things like um, uncertainty quantification, adjoints in other contexts, um, optimal design, ensemble simulations in a more advanced way than running parameter simulations and um, um, looking at all of the results. And of course we can integrate, I write here earthquake physics, but it really should be um, um, solid earth um, computational seismology applications into rapid response. Not only earthquake, we have a lot of rapid tsunami response or volcano uh, ecology response in the project. So with the calls that you've seen today um, in cheese, we don't only have these um, uh, infrastructure technical aspects, we also want to do some science. And um, I think I, I just put it in another order just to show like, which science questions we are addressing in the project with each of these codes. Um, so there's something called pilot demonstrator one, urgent seismic simulations, and we also had a slide. Um, it's really, it's led by ETH Zurich and, and by Marta who joined here. Um, and it's really about running um, computational seismology forward simulations based on point sources um, rapidly after an event happened. <clears throat> um, PD4 is another seismology related um, pilot that was not mentioned and that's about physics-based tsunami earthquake interactions. That's relates a bit to the um, introductory slides we had for SISO where we're trying to capture better the interaction of earthquakes and tsunamis. And as I said, we're extending uh, some of the codes to do this all in one uh, in one model, and that will lead to problem sizes for which we really need these large machines um, to couple all of this together. Um, this is an example for a Hellenic arc scenario that we're working on. Um, and we have PD5, so that's the PSHA hazard assessment one, and here's a, an example of the Husavik flat fault zone, so those um, that are monitoring the seismicity in Iceland, they know that there was, this summer, was quite a lot of activity in the North Iceland in this very complex rupture zone. And um, yeah, we're running um, dynamic models for that, but we're also trying to find out how um, forward simulations or physics-based simulations can actually be integrated in uh, physics-based probabilistic hazard assessment, which is uh, often relying on empirical assumptions. And PD9 seismic tomography, and it's just another plot here, here, but um, the spectrum 3D and Sal was trying to um, push the boundaries of what you can do in terms of imaging and tomography um, of solid earth. And uh, these were the slides that I prepared and I want to wrap up and thank 
all of you for staying also until now. And especially um, thank Jose and the um, supercomputing team in Stuttgart for making all of this possible. And Rose, who actually did a lot of work in preparing the workshop and advertising it so well that we have <laughs> many more interest than I could attend. And of course, all the instructors that took out time of their research to um, prepare and conduct a training with you. So thank you very much for all of this. That's it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, do you want to take questions? You can applaud maybe, <laughs> not me, but um, <laughs> people I think. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes. And so then. I should have maybe shared the links again to the Zoom room. So maybe that's a good idea if you could somehow bring that up so people know um, in the chat, people know where to go. If they're feeling lost, training is finished. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I don't have the links. Somebody has the email open with the links for the Zoom room that it's a good idea to bring that up. Maybe whoever can share them. I actually didn't get the email myself. Ah, they're in the chat now. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so we meet there, I think, at 2? Yes, at 2 o'clock. So then for me, it's time to say goodbye uh, to most of you. I will probably not see everybody in the uh, next sessions. It has been a pleasure to organize this meeting. I think it was, uh, for me at least, totally very interesting. I think it was a great success. I had the impression uh, all of you learned a lot. And I hope you we'll be able to repeat this. And where well, there's huge demand for this kind of courses, uh, as was said a couple of times already, with at least another 120 participants on the waiting list. So we could run this course uh, three, four times over. <laughs> uh, let's see whether we can do this. And yeah, it was a lot of fun for me. And I hope to meet some of you at other occasions elsewhere. So the plan now is to continue at two o'clock in this separate uh, Zoom meetings. Bye bye. Yeah, I just want to say again, thanks to Dave for setting everything up and organizing Thank everything, you. helping us out with the issues on the cluster, and of course getting it back online for everyone. Yeah, yeah. I will forward this to our administrator. They did a lot of work this morning. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks everyone for attending from the Salvas team as well. I uh, hope to see you in our little room and thanks to everyone else for the presentations too, very interesting.